Good evening and welcome to the August 24th, 2015 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, could you please take the roll? Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. DuPont? Mr. Wood? Thank you. Uh, and for the record, in the absence of Mr. Wood and Mr. DuPont, both Ms. Oglis and uh, Mr. Bealey will be voting members tonight. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from the August 3rd, 2015 meeting. I was not present for this meeting, so I'll recuse myself from this one. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. For the second, any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Shout out to be unanimous. Before we move on into the action items on our agenda, um, quick housekeeping note. Item number nine has been tabled at the request of the applicant. That is uh, Tina and Eric Richardson requesting a preliminary subdivision review for a four-lot residential subdivision titled Fortune Estates Assessor's Map R10 Lot 9. Again, that is tabled at the request of the applicant, so we will not be discussing that this evening. Next item is a consent item. Navigators Properties LLC requests a final site plan review for a transmission tower at 79 Holmes Road, Scarborough Fish and Game Site, Assessor's Map R33, Lot 1. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as board members will note, this item was before you at your last meeting in which um, the board was generally satisfied with the, um, with the plan set. The applicant was asked to make a couple of minor revisions, which they have done. Uh, staff have had an opportunity to review those, and um, at the direction of the board, we have drafted a motion for your consideration. Thank you, Jay. Uh, unless there are any further questions or items which board members would like to discuss, uh, we can just move right into a draft motion that we have prepared here. I don't think we need to hear a presentation. I'm happy to sit down and shut up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Say that. <laughs> so I, I'm going to make this motion. Uh, it has some fairly lengthy findings and then a, just a few conditions. We don't always read the findings, all the findings um, ver uh, verbally at the meeting in the interest of time, but um, given that this is the first one of these that we're approving under this ordinance, I just wanted to have it be very clear and really spell out all of, the due, all of the due diligence that was done and make sure that we articulate for the public um, what these findings are. I move to approve the application of Navigator Properties LLC under Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, and Chapter 405B, the Town of Scarborough Site Plan Review Ordinance, with the following, plan, following findings and conditions. Findings. Navigator Properties LLC proposes to develop a 100-foot monopo monopole-style transmission tower on property owned and operated by the Scarborough Fish and Game Association at 79 Holmes Road. The property is further identified on the Scarborough tax maps as R033001. The property is in the Rural Farming District, RF, and the Transmission Tower Overlay District, TTOD. In reviewing the application, the board has considered the priority of location standards set forth within the TTOD provisions and finds the applicant has provided sufficient evidence demonstrating that a location of higher priority cannot reasonably accommodate the applicant's requirements for coverage improvements within the intended area. Upon concluding review of the priority of location standards, the board finds that the subject parcel exceeds the minimum lot size standards for transmission towers in the TTOD and the proposed location of the tower on the property exceeds the 150% setback from property lines. The board finds that the 150-foot tower height enables the co-location of three or more additional antennas and results in no material increase of visual impacts of the tower over the standard height limitation of 130 feet. Further, the extensive existing on-site tree growth coupled with the large acreage of the property and distance from abutters is found to provide adequate screening of the proposed tower. 
Based on the review of the application and supporting documentation, the board finds that the proposed design, location, and style of the transmission tower adequately addresses the standards for transmission towers in the TTOD section of the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, as well as the applicable site plan review ordinance requirements. Conditions. Number one, prior to the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall pay the peer review fees. Number two, Prior to the issuance of the building permit, a surety shall be provided to the planning department to guarantee the removal of the tower should it become abandoned. This documentation must comply with the provisions of Section 9F21 of the Zoning Ordinance. Three, to maintain adequate buffering of the tower, no existing trees may be removed within the 150% tower radius or easterly of the, quote, tie line for lease area, end quote, both as depicted on sheet C101 on the site plan with the revision date of August 21, 2015, except for clearing for the installation of the tower and associated infrastructure or to remove the dead, dying, or diseased trees. Any other tree removal will require planning board review and approval. That is a motion. Second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor. Well, that to be unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Good luck. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Our next item, Bessie Square requests sketch plan review for an amended site plan review for 264 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U41, Lot 1. Jay? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let's see, as the board, as the applicant's narrative indicates, they're really before the board for two reasons. Um, the first is as an update on short-term short development plans for the existing site, uh, previously approved site um, within the TVC2. Um, this is the site just across the street from Town Hall. Um, currently houses a mixed-use building where Scarborough Grounds is, and there's a, a pad site, an elevator shaft across the street from it that the applicant is looking to move forward with closing in, consistent with the previously approved plans. Um, and then the applicant also, in our discussions with them, uh, want to foreshadow with the board some site plan modifications they may be seeking in the future in terms of uh, there's to be, was pre or is approved a third building on the site and the applicant has some uh, alternative plans that they'd like to uh, run by the board and, and receive some guidance on. So um, with that, I turn it back to you. and. and I have the applicant give you the rest of the right. details. Thanks, Jay, and I'll turn it over to the applicant. Uh, good evening. My name is Joe Laveria. I'm from Face Buffett and Thorndike, and I'm here also with Cynthia Taylor from Housing Initiatives in New England. And the Bessie Square project, some of you may remember, as, as uh, Jay indicated, it was around 2006, 2007 that we were in front of the board for site subdivision approval right across the street, kind of from here. So it's easy enough to see, was a mixed-use development, still is a mixed-use development, uh, it was three buildings. Uh, if you look at the site plan, which is this is the final approved plan here, there were three buildings. It was They were labeled an A, B, or C, so A, a is the one that's closest to Bessie Commons, B was the one in the back. This building A was retail on the bottom, office on the top. Building B was the one that would be at the back of the site that would parallel Route 1. That's the one that had the live work units, as you remember. And then Building C um, is the one that is fully constructed. Was, again, retail on the bottom, office on the on the second. And uh, one of the primary drivers for that one was the coffee shop, obviously, as you know. So first building was built. Second building was started. And that's pretty much what we've been ever since. So it's been a long time looking at a stair tower. Um, as Jay said, part of it, so in the proposal that we've sent, which is the sketch plan we've submitted to the, to the board as the second part of this, um, the proposal is to uh, change the, the building B, the way the stair, or building A with the stair towers will essentially stay the same, but the changes in use would be to put a restaurant in the first floor as opposed to the retail use. Uh, second floor would continue to stay as office use. Um, the second part of it would be to eliminate the back building, building B, and expand the, with a deck, 
if you've been in there, you'll know that the foundation is in place, and it's basically a, it's a retaining wall structure with where parking underneath was planned in the original development. So there'd be a deck structure that would be built over the top of that to expand parking and then enable that underneath area to be used potentially as storage in the future. Um, which shown on the, on the sketch plan <coughs> in the future also, further back um, on Bessie Commons would, is potentially another building that would be built there that would, again, parallel Route 1, so it would start to make that the framing of the courtyard as was the original proposal, but that building would be further back. Again, that's not part of the Bessie Square proposal, but it's just the applicant kind of sharing their future plans for it since they control both properties, in Bessie Commons and Bessie Square. So what I submitted to you in the, in the packet was, again, a little packet, a little summary of where we're going, but it's also one to share with the board our parking requirements. Um, we, with the expanded parking, we have adequate parking. Um, with the elimination of building B in particular, we have adequate parking to support both, and one of our needs was to provide a little bit more parking on the site. There's concern that the parking is a little tight on that site as it is, especially with the restaurant use coming in. So we're really here seeking uh, your input on what, we're, what our vision is, I guess, for the project right now, and I think the applicant would like to move forward fairly expeditiously with, with uh, the construction of building A, um, but obviously with that comes an amended site plan, and, and we'll be back in front of you again for it. But we're just looking your thoughts on that direction and really the elimination of building B. And with that, yeah, I'll answer as many as I can, or Cindy's here as well to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, since I believe she's the only person on this board who was here when the, the original approval was granted <coughs> back in 06, um, we'll start with Ms. Aguas. There are some wonderful things about getting older. <coughs> this is one of them. Welcome. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> and um, first of all, welcome back. It's wonderful to see this as a potential design for Bessie Commons. and. The fact that what you're proposing for the square is to do something, anything, with that vacant building. But you really had me when you said restaurant. Wow. What a novel idea. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. I have no problems with the parking deck re, um, <clears throat> replacing the originally proposed um, building there. Basically, we need, a, we need that more than we need what it was designed to do in the first place. And I'm sure that there'll be plenty of parking for all of that. Um, it started off as a um, Class A effort, and I'm sure it'll continue to be a Class A effort. And um, what's happening around us here in this building and up and down Route 1 in here is just all happening at the same time. It's all pretty magical. And this is a wonderful step. I'm sure that when we get right down to the nitty gritties, we will have questions and concerns and so on, but right now I just think it's very positive and glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? I think Ms. Ogles did a nice job summarizing it. it looks nice. Thanks. Oh, I've got Okay. Ron? Yeah. Um, the restaurant, it's, it's going to be where in, in this situation? It's going to be in the first level of building. Uh, excuse me, would you introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I am. I'm uh, Cindy Taylor, and I'm the president of Housing Initiatives, and we own <coughs> Bessie Square as well as Bessie Commons. So, so this is Building B. That's building A, I'm sorry. Building, building A. A. Yep, that is Building A. That's the one where the stair tower is today. That's the building that, that will be being built that will house the restaurant. Okay, and that's going to be a privately owned restaurant. There aren't cooking facilities over there now, if I understand, right? Well, this is a no vacant. It's, there's there's nothing there. Nothing. There's no building there at all. No it's building. the building that has the okay. stair tower. What is over there then? An what elevator is there tower. The people are, are living in. Well, Scarborough oh. Grounds is there on the first floor of of what is Building C. Okay. It's the only existing. But, okay. Would you like me to explain that? Yeah, please. Um, in Building C, which is the existing structure, um, we have Scarborough Grounds on the first level as well as the Gallery Hair Salon at the rear, and we have GRSS, a wealth management company, on the second floor. And those are to remain, and I think we've identified that their needs. In terms of parking, um, the proposed building will look very much like that building in terms of quality and um, 
and visually it'll be basically the same with the same exterior. It has a, a granite band around the base. It has a, uh, a standing steel seam, standing seam, steel uh, um, roof, and um, a you know very classical Greek revival look in the building. Um, we were just trying to expand some parking, and we knew that we had to build out this before we started Bessie Commons second phase. And so we are here tonight basically looking to start construction. We think that we can support the first phase of this building with the parking that's existing, but we wanted to share with you that we intend to build a parking deck and expand the parking in, in lieu of building B. So I hope that explains it a little better. I, I think guess, guess where my confusion was, it has nothing to do with the Bessie School. Is that right? The second build, the building that we're sharing with you at the rear, this, this building here, which we are using to frame in what was the original uh, intent of the three buildings, will be the second phase of um, Bessie Commons. But that building, um, we're going to develop over the winter, and we'll come back to you with a, with a full presentation with architecture that goes with that. But that's our intent <coughs> at this point in time. Okay. I don't have anything else. Okay. Thanks. Roger? Thank you. Um, first, I think everybody in Scarborough is very happy about this. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty the, embarrassed about that. They're going to miss the elevator shaft. The, <laughs> the economy has not done any favors for us. Um, I, th I, think, uh, I think what you're doing here is um, really well thought out and, um, you know, utilizing that Building B, you know, which was going to be, that's the one that's being um, you're going to turn it into parking, is that correct? correct? That yeah. is correct. I think that's was, – wasn't there uh, something in the plans originally for residential? It was. That yeah. was a, a live-work uh, building design that had uh, residential use on the second floor, and first floor was okay, gotcha. retail office kind of space. Okay. Um, I, I think it looks great, and uh, I'm sure everybody's going to be very pleased when it's all done. So I'm all set. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, like my fellow board members, I'm – Excited to see this and appreciate having this update. Um, and I think, uh, as others have stated, it, it looks like a continuation of a, a very high quality design approach in terms of um, how the architecture looks so far, as well as the kind of overall built environment. One question I have on the parking deck is what, um, what the estimated, at least roughly estimated height of that will be. The parking deck, uh, the way we've uh, designed it currently, it, it's at the same elevation as the uh, existing parking. We're actually going to be cutting down some of that concrete and mm. uh, pouring okay. the deck at the same level so that there's no grade change. Okay, so it'll be accurate. That was one thing I wasn't totally clear on because um, I was going to ask. Yeah, it's certainly it's an elevation going forward, but obviously that's not. Yeah, it's as great as you come in through the, the existing parking field, you will drive right up onto it. There will be a, a one-story relief on the back side. Okay. All right. Um, and so obviously we'll want to, we like to see rear elevations as well as we, when we get to that level of detail. Um, we but will. Again. And without a doubt, this would require uh, a railing system mm -hmm. on the back side. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're, we're going to try to create a pedestrian link for the, for the seniors to gain access to this whole development as well. Oh, good. That was actually uh, something I was going to ask about with, with the, basically common ownership, whether that would be some opportunities for that. We have um, two ways of doing that. We have a, uh, there's a retaining wall right here right now. Uh, actually, it, it continues right there. And we're going to take that out and rebuild it so we, we'll get an access point there. And then this sidewalk is not currently built, and we'll build that. So we'll have two means of access from our existing complex. <coughs> Well, like others, I can certainly vouch for the fact that that lot gets cramped at times, which is a good problem to have. And um, you know, as we move into, um, I think the board is pretty unanimous in its support of this concept, and we'll look forward to seeing the details when we get into the actual site and approval phase. And we'll obviously look forward to seeing a little more detail on, on architecture as well as um, sort of the circulation plan, given the additional parking and. Uh, the fact that there is a drive-through there on the other side of Building C, just to sort of make sure we understand all that. But that's, those are all things we typically look at at that stage. So, thank you. I, oh, I just don't know if I didn't know if it was made clear, but what we really want to do is be able to 
move forward with the construction of Building A and then come back to you and, and finish out the site plan with our development in the rear. So I think that um, with the schedules for parking that Joe has shown you, um, we have adequate parking to, to finish the restaurant on the first level, probably need more for the second level, but mm -hmm. um, the, under your ordinance, we have satisfied the requirement for parking with the, the numbers that we have currently. Right. So and that is, that is a, good, a good point to, to make. Uh, do you have, I don't know whether you have the actual restaurant tenant or not, do you have at least a sense of what, what the hours will be and how much overlap there will be between them and and the coffee shop? I do. Um, this restaurant is primarily going to be open at night. They will do some lunches as well. Um, they will not be allowed to do breakfast, which is what Scarborough Downs has asked for. And so there will, will not be any overlap during the early part of the day. And then um, this is a privately owned small restaurant, and um, I think it's fair for me to share who's doing it, and that is Patrick O'Reilly. Oh, really? Yes, so I'm very pleased. Um, to be sharing this uh, opportunity with him. Great. Thank you. Oh, oh right, he's uh, an Irish pub. <laughs> I would think it's true. Well, thank you, and unless anyone uh, has any additional comments or unless you need more feedback from us at this stage. I do want to make sure I'm, I'm sure. Go ahead, Susan. I'm sorry. I was so taken with Patrick O'Reilly, I forgot to. I just want to make sure. So you're going to come and present. Well, here he is. There's nothing they have to. There's really nothing they have to do in order to start complete to right. start right. to that construct that building. Sure. Okay, so we're not going to see you again until you're ready to talk about the parking. That's correct. The addition of the parking. That's okay. Correct. We're working hard to get our working drawings approved and ready for a uh, building permit, mm -hmm. or building A, and then we'll start. Okay. Right after Thank that, you. we've had some preliminary work done. That was what it was, but then I got confused. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So everyone's everyone's clear on that. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you and good luck. We'll Thank you. Seeing it. We'll see you. Yay. Item number six. Dunstan Properties LLC requests master plan review as part of the plan development process for Dunstan Village Master Plan, Assessor's Map U30. Lots 16 and 17. Okay. Yep, like Mr. Chair. See, this item was before the board at your last meeting for a site inventory uh, analysis review. That was the first step in the plan development review, which is required in the TVC3 district for development of this uh, characteristics. Uh, this is the second of three steps in the plan development review process, the plan development, um, or the master plan, I'm sorry, phase. Um, which ultimately culminates into a site plan review at a future date. That being said, um, the purpose of the master plan phase is for the board to make a determination that uh, this plan, the master plan, is consistent with the site inventory analysis plan and that the master plan is further uh, consistent with the standards of a plan development in the TVC district, which are spelled out in the zoning ordinance as well as the, uh, generally with the design standards. Again, there's a lot more details that will be worked out when we get to the site plan stage, but we want to be sure at this point that we're showing general consistencies. Uh, to that end, staff has reviewed uh, what the applicant has provided um, and, and generally find that the applicant has really worked to incorporate a number of the elements for a master plan uh, development or plan development uh, in, into this scenario. Um, one of the things that uh, just touch on, uh, obviously you have our staff comments, I'll touch on a couple of items. Um, one of the allowances within the TVC3 district plan development allows for uh, flexible uh, yard setbacks for buildings uh, that the planning board can consider as part of this review process. If you find again that the design is consistent with the purpose of the district. Um, while at this point, obviously we don't have the details to know exactly what those setbacks are going to be because there aren't right away lines drawn out, I think you know, those details can be worked out in future phases, but now is the time for the board to sort of echo uh, if you think what is being proposed is generally uh, in the right direction. Um, 
One of the things uh, that the board might want to consider and did consider during the site inventory analysis, given that this site, the board really found this site to be very developable. Frankly, there weren't a lot of uh, limiting constraints, uh, but the one thing that the board did flag was uh, the potential for buffering to the abutters to the north and south, um, and really taking a look at how um, that um, is being treated and um, if it's being adequately addressed. The other item that's worthy of discussion tonight and ensuring that the board finds with any master plan decision you make um, that the location of the drive-through uh, for, I believe it's been identified as a bank drive-through, which is along Route 1, um, is consistent with, again, the purposes of the district and the design standards. The design standards do state that drive-through sh should avoid uh, facing public streets. Um, Again, it's located along Route 1. However, given that there's a vast internal network <laughs> of streets, um, the board that are really you know, more pedestrian-oriented um, board can sort of consider what other, it's worthy of a discussion anyway about what type of locations have been looked at by the applicant and, and sort of discuss the merits of the proposed location. Um, I guess the last item I'll touch on just Again, um, this is really moving as as this moves through the process. There's an opportunity, um, as our, our our town engineer looked at it, an opportunity for some um, for some green infrastructure and LID stormwater measures on site, which are sought through the ordinance. And so, we'd like an opportunity to get together with the applicant before they start doing their engineering at staff level to talk about some thoughts we might have. Um, also a good opportunity to talk about sort of the interface of the public and private um, uh, infrastructure that is being proposed, some of these amenities, the, the larger um, esplanades, the sidewalks, the what's currently shown as I think a, found, uh, a fountain in the middle of the roadway, how, you know, um, again, those sort of, those articulate a lot of the goals that are set forth in the TVC district, but we want to be sure that um, everyone's clear on sort of the maintenance responsibility of those moving forward. So um, those are items that we want to flag at this point, not as a concern, but just be sure we're, we're talking early. So with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I'll hand it over to the applicant. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Uh, my name is Tom Emery. I'm with uh, Foresight Architects in Falmouth, representing uh, Elliot Chamberlain. Uh, Mark Burns is the architect on this project, the president of our company, and uh, Sean Frank, uh, who's with Sebago Technic. Uh, we did present this master plan uh, earlier this summer or spring and went through a general presentation on it. It's uh, still at a conceptual level. If you'd like, I can go just briefly over the plan for those who may not have seen it and then uh, I think address some of the uh, comments that uh, Jay raised in his memo. Sure. Shall I do that? Thank you. Uh, just to get everybody oriented, the uh, bottom of the sheet is Route 1. The center of the plan here is Stewart Drive. And the organizing elements of this plan and the whole theme behind it is a traditional mixed-use urban village center. Uh, and with that, we're looking at on-street parking, and the difference with this on-street parking is that it's planned as part of the overall development. It's not an afterthought that's just added on uh, at the 11th hour. But with that, we have the uh, east-west spine here, which is Stewart Street, which connects over to uh, Dunstan Crossing. And uh, along Route 1, we have uh, mixed uses facing Route 1 from residential to commercial mixed use with residential above to the drive-in uh, business or drive-through window uh, that Jay referred to and then a traditional <coughs> uh, office or mixed use office building. Along the spine is diagonal parking which is very traditional in the middle of this at the crossroads. We have the uh, sort of the village Main Street east-west and north-south. We have an open space spine that is uh, linked in the center by a pavilion, uh, pedestrian walkways, fountain, and anchoring that at the end is a larger uh, apartment building. This is the one that Jay uh, has stated in the memo we have issues with because we exceed 12 units per building. We're aware of that. 
and uh, Elliot is either going to work that through with the town in terms of the number of units <coughs> we're proposing, or we'll just simply uh, put it in as age restricted. But right now, we're just looking at it in terms of a placeholder on the plan. So we have the open space spine uh, north south. Uh, the the uh, in terms of the phasing of the plan, uh, that really is somewhat up in the air, but clearly the, the uh, main street is part of phase one. It looks as though this proposed building A, which is a restaurant use, may be one of the first uses. That, of course, brings us all the way to the uh, back of the site, so to speak. And uh, Elliot has said all along, whatever we do here, there has to be a sense of completion and a sense of place created immediately. So even though uh, part of this site might be rough graded and, and uh, seeded, Everything within the main street primarily will be, there'll be a sense of completion as we uh, go along. Uh, the reason for the uh, drive-through uh, business here is that we, one, uh, wanted to get it as close to Route 1 as possible and get traffic off Route 1 and then into the business and then exiting uh, at our main road rather than having separate driveways on the property exclusively for the drive-through window. Uh, we do show a, uh, a canopy here over the drive-through, and the idea is that that would be an architectural element that would be have a screening element that would go to the ground. In addition to that, through the use of berms and mixed evergreens and deciduous plantings, that would help screen it as well. It's not a, intended to be a, a large user, but something that whether or a bank or a drive-in uh, through a restaurant or coffee shop uh, would be appropriately scaled. Uh, I think one of the more interesting aspects of the plan is the idea of the mixed uses on Main Street where we have uh, shops on the, on the ground floor and opportunities for the shopkeepers or shop owners to live uh, in units uh, up, up on the uh, second floor. And again, the, the scale of all of this uh, is very much to uh, pedestrian human scale. So we go from, we transition from the commercial center toward the residential uses, and within the residential uses, we have two clown, uh, townhouse uh, courtyards uh, that orient into each other and also have an open space uh, feature on a smaller scale from the uh, town common. The parking, is there is considerable parking here to meet the ordinance. Uh, however, the parking, for the most part, is broken up into smaller lots <coughs> parked behind the building so that the uh, pedestrian spaces remain free-flowing and the visual aspect of that remains uh, true to the, the village feel. Uh, in terms of buffering, uh, to the extent that we can save plant material, that, that's a first start, but we're looking at probably berms and then evergreens and mixed evergreens on both the north and south side. Along Route 1, we're, we're proposing berms and a mixture of evergreens uh, overstory and understory trees, we don't want to create a wall of just evergreen vegetation. We want something that provides views into the site but will screen the parking that's facing uh, Route 1. The idea is that this, is, this, this whole place is a brand in and of itself. When people say they're going to Dunstan uh, Village, uh, that will immediately at some point set an image in people's mind and you will see that image start from Route 1 and as you go through uh, the main street. Uh, along, the, along Route 1, uh, we do have two open space areas for pedestrian use, passive recreation. There is a sidewalk already along Route 1 uh, that we would tie into and wide sidewalks all the way through the site uh, for pedestrian, uh, both for residents and for people shopping and, and going through the site. Uh, if, if there are, are any questions about the overall plan, I'd be happy to answer that, or otherwise I can go into the more of the specifics of Jay's comment. Um, you can go on into the next phase, and then okay. we can kind of bundle our questions together, I think. I do have one question. On, on yeah. Building D, the townhouses on the bottom. Yes. Mm -hmm. is, the, is the parking lot facing the rear of the building? Or the front of the building. The parking lot here. Yes. Parking lot. This is facing the end of the building. The units. The entrance. The main entrance to the units face out into this uh, pedestrian spine that links into this uh, central open space. And then the back of the units would have. There's an implied uh, little stone wall here with implied. Uh, Terraces of, uh, at the back of the units would be the idea there. 
Okay, thank you. I think we can get through some of these uh, pretty quickly because uh, we support and agree with much of what Jay said. Uh, in terms of shared parking, it's not to our advantage or anybody's advantage to put in more pavement or pay for more storm drainage and utilities than is absolutely necessary. The key, however, is to be sure what we propose for shared parking is workable. And as an example, if you have a commercial use adjacent to a residential use or you have them together and the hours of the commercial uses overlap with the time of day in which residents would be home, that isn't going to work. So we have to be very careful about how we uh, share that parking, but in general, there's not an issue with shared parking. I think it's to everybody's advantage uh, to do that, and, and we certainly agree with that. Uh, in terms of building H5, uh, that, uh, as I mentioned before, will either be restricted to the current ordinance minimum, uh, maximum number of units in that building, or we'll uh, propose it as an age-restricted building if Elliott isn't successful in, in working through the zoning change in the meantime. Uh, project phasing, again, phase one would be the main spine uh, and uh, probably toward the back of the site where the restaurant's located. There'd be a sense of completeness as you go up that main su uh, spine. The sidewalks would be completed on each side and the street trees would be in place and the street lighting. And then the areas beyond that would be uh, site prepped but left in a finished look with, with seating. So our, our thing that we want to really try to avoid with this project is a sense of an ongoing construction site that never has a sense of uh, end completion. We'd like to have every, every phase uh, end up with a, with a sense of uh, completeness. Uh, I've spoken to the uh, orientation in, of the drive-through. We feel it's, it's probably most attractive to have it near Route 1, otherwise if it's deeper into the site, it, it will not attract customers. And I think it's our responsibility to design a building and a circulation system around that building that screens the drive-through component and that the building's in integral with the other architecture on the site. So it, it's just not a, a franchise standing off by itself. Uh, in terms of uh, the utilities and stormwater, uh, I was previously with uh, Stantec Engineering in Scarborough and we did a, a demonstration rain garden project uh, in Portland uh, and around Back Cove. And uh, we very much, as the Sean and uh, Elliot uh, support, looking at low impact development. Again, it's sort of a win-win for everyone. It saves in construction dollars, it's better for the environment. Uh, my only caveat to that is I want to be sure that with a village environment like this that's so pedestrian oriented that we don't have what I refer to as a little New Orleans where we end up with all of these low wet areas and with, with raised sidewalks. But other than that, if we can accomplish those in the traditional ways that uh, I think are very attractive, uh, we more than uh, would be interested in working very closely uh, with the town uh, on that. Uh, flexible yard setbacks are certainly uh, something that we'll be looking uh, for going, going forward uh, so that we can complete this as a, like an overall unified master plan development rather than individual lots with a building stuck in the middle of them with a parking lot behind them. Um, so with that, uh, we will be coming forward with the individual, either individual buildings or group of buildings uh, as a site plan uh, review and subdivision uh, through the design process. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we turn to general board discussion, we do have the opportunity for public comment. If anyone is interested, uh, has a comment or a question, feel free to come on up to the podium. Identify yourself. All right, seeing none, uh, I will note that we did receive an email from an abutting property owner from uh, Gary and Nancy Coffin at Five Queens Drive um, stating that they're abutting property owners uh, and they could not attend tonight's meeting, but they were curious about the type of buffering plan between the project and their home on Queens Drive. So uh, applicants already spoken a little bit to that buffering and certainly that's something that we'll want to see more detail on as we as we move into more detail on this. So, 
Um, now turning to the board, Roger, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. Uh, <coughs> um, just to clarify, um, do I understand what you're saying? Uh, building A is going to be constructed first. I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> the uh, batteries in my hearing aid have gone, so if you could just speak into the microphone and speak up a little bit. Sure. Well. Um, uh, your plans are to uh, construct building A first? Yes. Okay. What about, and, and then the other buildings will be ba basically built as, um, depending on what the tenant is going to be? Or? That's right, and, and the marketing uh, demand. Okay. What about on the right side there? Are those going to be the residential? Are those going to be built um, sooner than later? or H3, H4. Yeah, these here. Yes. Yeah. Again, those will be built if, if the market push the whole project at one time, we jump on it at one time. But the idea is to get the main street done, and then if the market is driving the townhouses or the building at the end, then the infrastructure to get to those locations would be complete in the same way that the, the main street is complete. That is, the streetscape to those locations would be completed and the parking to support it. Okay. So if you approach those buildings, you'll, you'll have a sense that they're, the public realm is, is a complete uh, end state phase. Okay. Um, the other question uh, I had is um, the parking area where it says A, top left, is that where the excavation area is yeah, that's, currently? That's the area of the gravel pit. The gravel pit. Yeah. And, and so basically that's going to be leveled off or made into a yeah. landscape. There's, there's to a made higher point of land here, and the ground is very malleable. It's, it's uh, very workable. So the idea in site prep is we're going to move this material over here and reclaim this back back corner. And then the remaining portion of that will be graded out, and that's uh, going to be an open space element. Okay. Um, I have no further questions. I think it looks terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Ron? Yeah. Uh, just following up, what about building D? Because we're talking about the drive through Is that on the initial plan, or is that a future, too? That's, that could be part of the initial plan if, if uh, a customer came in, I mean, a, a, you know, a buyer came in uh, in the early phase and wanted to develop that site. And the reason why I asked about the uh, end of the building is that uh, uh, we've been pushing, and I know that how things are structured here makes it difficult, that there's not a view from Route 1 on to parking, so whatever can be done to buffer that would be uh, greatly appreciated. And the only other thing is, and uh, this is based on a uh, comment that... Uh, staff made is that uh, where this is going to be piecemeal depending on who's going to be coming in at what time, uh, what the terms of future ownership is and who's going to take care of it and maintenance and so mm -hmm. forth and so on so that we don't have a mismatch or something that's not my responsibility in the final analysis. Mm -hmm. How's that going to be handled? Yeah, that will all be worked out with, with the town. Okay. That's all I have right now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Nick? Uh, I think, yeah, I guess another question, uh, follow-up question on uh, Building D. It, I thought I read in here, and I, I could have misread it. Um, is it supposed to be either a commercial business um, or a restaurant? I know a restaurant is a commercial Building business D. as well, but um, it, are, do you have restaurant plans there or that, bank plans? That's, that's I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's intended to be or it's shown as a drive-through type business, so that would in indicate that it's either a bank or uh, like a coffee uh, shop or a small restaurant type use that would have a drive-through uh, demand. Yeah, and, and the reason I ask is I think use is important too. The um, mm -hmm. last time you were here, I raised concerns about stacking on your front entry coming in from US Route 1, cars trying to reverse out of those spots. The traffic impact of a drive-through restaurant, whether it's a Dunkin' Donuts or something, versus an actual bank, the difference is, is massive. I don't yeah. mind it if it's a bank having those spots where you reverse out because you're not going to see as much traffic come through. Mm -hmm. So that would be one area of concern I have right here. Good is, point. You know, if you don't know exactly, then I'm worried about those parking spots as you mm -hmm. first come in off of Route 1. Yeah. And that's, other than that, I think this is, a, this is a nice plan. I like the concept. Um, you know, I look forward to jumping into more details later. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? Um, I... I also want to join the 
the group is saying really positive things about it. It's in a great location. It's going to add a great deal to, <clears throat> to the Dunstan area. The concerns are in the details, and we'll be seeing a lot more mm -hmm. of the details. Um, but I expect it's going to be a uh, top-of-the-line proposal. I do agree that a bank versus a restaurant at that location would make traffic. Mm -hmm. I, you know, at this point, you're just thinking about it. But I want to just go on record as saying the same Certainly. thing is that I understand wanting to put something up there that's commercial and that you can build into your presentation, but a bank would make me a lot happier than a restaurant. Um, oh, something else. Oh, and again, the landscape lady. I, I understand what it is you're saying, and you know what your concept is, but mm. again, the devil's in the details. So. Right. In the meantime, thank you very much. Yes, it's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'm hearing pretty, pretty much unanimous uh, support for the concept here. Uh, obviously, some details to work through. Um, I'll echo what Mr. McGee and Ms. Agla said about the drive-through, uh, and that the the type of use there, whether it's mm -hmm. restaurant or something like a bank, uh, makes a big difference in terms of intensity of, of use and potential uh, traffic and safety issues. And I would also feel more comfortable with a bank type use if there if there needs to be a drive-through there uh, at all. Um, aside from that, I'm not really hearing uh, concern about having a drive-through front, <coughs> if you will, on Route 1, per se. Um, and uh, I, I know f and I feel that way as well. I think for me it's a combination of um, the buffering and some assurance that, we, that you indicated um, that will be an actual architectural element and it won't just be a you know, blank drive-through um, that people look at as they go by on Route 1. Um, and I also I appreciate the thought that really went into thinking about uh, the access and not having an additional curb cut and um, having it come in through the site but not be buried within the site. And I certainly understand that from, from a business perspective as well. Um, also appreciate the willingness to work with the town on the green infrastructure and some of the other details that have been, that have been mentioned. And um, would just reiterate that uh, buffering will be a, a concern or a not necessarily concerned, but an area of focus for Certainly. us and for others, and certainly the abutters. And there's buffering from Route 1 as well as from the, the abutting owners. And I think we generally appreciate the fact that you don't want to wall off your site from Route 1, and I think from a planning perspective, we would all agree with that. Um, but we'll just look forward to seeing more detail on that as we go forward. Um, I have this a comment. Go ahead, Ron. I am not arbitrarily against the restaurant there. Now, I just want that on the record. That I am not arbitrarily. I'd want to see details and further, but I'm not going to say that I'm against the restaurant per se. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak for others, but I wouldn't be categorically categorically against it either. I just think it would, for me, raise the burden a little bit mm -hmm. in terms of um, looking at you know, circulation and access. Nick, did you if want I, to yeah, if I could just clarify, yeah. it's not that I'm against a restaurant there, it's the parking spots that I'm worried yeah. about. So yeah. if those disappeared, it, that doesn't mean as much to me what type of use I've received. Yeah. It, and, and the concern is actually just the stacking and the traffic impact, sure. not necessarily what type of business is there. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, uh, we do uh, need a vote for master plan approval. Um, I don't have a formal motion to put forward, um, but I just would, would uh, point out to the board that master plan approval at this point means that we're uh, indicating our general approval of the layout or overall layout orientation and massing of, of the buildings as as designed and the general in general the use of flexible uh, yard standards yard setback standards with the details as well as the other details that have been mentioned to be worked out um, going forward um, so with that I, I guess I would move that uh, we approve uh, the master plan for Dunstan Village. Second. Okay. We have a second. Is there a discussion? I, I think our if if I could just offer gone. for board consideration a, a, just a couple of conditions that I think will help a, identify the drive-through location question as well as just be sure that we do get a revised plan that demonstrates zoning compliance. I know um, uh, the applicants already indicated with I think it's. 
H8, or whatever that building is, um, uh, currently what's shown on the plan isn't zoning compliant, so I just want to be sure we have a plan that, you know, states <laughs> something that <laughs> the board can approve ultimately, and if the zoning changes, so be it. Um, and so to that end, I just offered two conditions. One, uh, that the plan be revised to address zoning compliance issue identified in planning staff's comments, which I think is generally just a change of the note on the plan. And the second one, details of the drive through location will be governed by traffic impacts of the use. However, the location is found to be generally favorable. Does that sort of capture the essence of the board's discussion? I think that works well. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, a, we have a seconded motion on the table to uh, approve the master plan for Dunstan Village. And I would propose that we amend that to include the two conditions as read by staff. Second. I'll second the amendment. We have that seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor? Show that to be unanimous. Thank you, and we'll thank you very much. The next stage. Our next item, Avesta Housing requests final site plan and subdivision review for Southgate House, 577 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U34, Lot 37. Jay? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is an item that has be been before this board a number of times. It's actually uh, most recently been before our council. Um, the reason for that is, as, as board members will note, the applicant is seeking to redevelop the Southgate House property um, with 50 affordable housing units. The proposal calls for the um, reuse or repurposing or re refurber uh, <laughs> updating of the Southgate House into eight units and a new building with 42 units. Um, and so there are a number of elements of this uh, proposal that exceeded permitted uses and activities within the TVC3 district. So the applicant has been before the council for a contract zone amendment, which was recently approved by council. I believe it was just last week. The applicant has recorded their contract zone with, at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. So this item is now ready for final action by this board. Um, I'll just sort of recap uh, the last meeting. Really, there are two sort of main elements that the board uh, wants to focus on in terms of access to the site and number of parking spaces. The board seemed generally favorable with the direction the applicant was providing at that time. And um, so staff has provided the board with a draft motion for consideration. I will note that in our staff comments, we had a, a host of comments sort of about fire lanes and access easement area. The applicant has provided a revised plan that staff was able to have adequate time to review um, and we're satisfied. Um, and so the motion reflects that plan date. Um, it, it sort of reflects, I think, the, the tone of the discussion from the board at the last meeting. Um, the changes do anyway. So um, with that, I would turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, I'd invite the applicant or applicant's representative to come on up if they do have anything to add at this point. Uh, good evening. My name is Dan Riley. I'm an engineer with Sebago Technics, and we're here on behalf of Vesta Housing. Um, and the architect, um, Rick Caduti and Maggie Stanley from Caduti Thomas, are here as well. Um, I think Jay's um, memo there and introduction fairly summarizes uh, where we are. Uh, we have been before the board on a number of occasions. And um, just to touch on a few of the, the, the changes since the last time um, we met with you um, that I think address the remaining comments that, that Jay alluded to. Um, the staff had asked uh, after our last plan review that we include provisions for a future access easement across this project property for an interconnection to the abutting property to the north, the former Estabrook site, such that if that property is developed in the future, an interconnection can be made between the two properties that would allow um, uh, uh, improved access on Route 1 and shared access between the two <coughs> properties. Um, we've sh showed that potential easement area and added notes to the plans at the, the recommendation of uh, Mr. Bacon, the town planner, uh, when Jay was on vacation. Um, to, so we've included that. Um, the all, we've also um, added notes on the plan regarding um, the ability to return to the planning staff um, for 
a de minimis site plan approval uh, should the porch on the exist existing building um, be removed. Um, as we've discussed before, the um, status of that porch from a historic perspective uh, has yet to be determined by the uh, Federal Park Service. And so um, we just want some flexibility <laughs> there that um, to be able to remove that porch if it's determined um, that that's the appropriate approach for the historic preservation of the, of the property. Uh, the final items that we did address, we spoke with the, uh, with the fire department last week and a couple of uh, minor changes to the plan. They don't really show up um, visually too much on the plans, but the uh, fire lane on the south side of the building or the left side of the building um, will be comprised, as we discussed last time, of a six-foot paved sidewalk um, with a reinforced turf um, area adjacent to it that would support a fire truck. Uh, that overall width has been widened to 16 feet. Uh, the paved portion remains six feet on the site, but we did widen that at the fire department's request. Um, to, to accommodate as much space as, as possible for the uh, fire apparatus. Uh, we've added some signage at, that, at the, the tip down where that location has come in. Um, we've also um, revised the plans to include, or we, we had included but clarified, some slope granite curbing around the drop-off area uh, that the fire department had requested. Um, and we just overall reviewed the plan um, to address their comments, and I believe, I believe we've done that. Um, so with that, really, the, um, the only um, remaining items, I think, have been addressed, and I understand the staff's prepared a, a motion with some conditions of approval. And with that, we'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Nick, do you have anything? Real quick, um, the easement, what, what is, what's, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> The easement covers, uh, what we've shown is an easement covering the entire entrance driveway to the site mm -hmm. and then providing access across to the abutting site opposite the circle turnaround. Uh -huh. We've shown that as, and the notes reflect that there's some flexibility in how that, the final design of that easement uh, could be revised uh, based on whatever future development plan comes in on the former entrance site. Yeah. And kudos to staff and to the applicant for making that a priority, I think that's a great move. Um, and also, like you said, may mitigate some future issues on getting into the site later if it's developed properly. Yep. So, kudos. That's it. Thank you. Susan? Um, still can't believe it's happening. Very <laughs> exciting. The only thing I have is a statement, because I say this every time we end up with a write-in and write-out only. It is the obvious solution to this. I have nothing against it except the only reason I'm not taking a stand against it is because this has been proven to be residential, light usage. Very quickly, people are going to get used to when they can and can't go in and out because of the traffic patterns during the course of the day. I think it can work. But generally speaking, a right out only means go like crazy across and take a left. And I don't want to bore people with the number of things that I have personally witnessed and um, maybe even been part of that is um, questionable, shall we say. So I just want everybody to know that <clears throat> this is being designed with the with a, uh, public safety in, in hand with all of this to make it as safe as it can possibly be. It is one of the parts of it that is a little iffy for me. And then I just am wondering, do we have any idea when we are going to know about the porch? I mean, is this going to be two years? And I would think you'd have to know before you could start making plans. Yeah, I don't know if you know the time frame is. Cool. Uh, hi, Kyle Ambler, Development Officer for Vesta. Uh, so we received a recommendation letter from the State Historic Preservation Office that went to the National Park mm -hmm. Service back at the end of July. Um, in that letter, they stated that they would recommend certain 20th century structures. So it wasn't clear if that meant the, the, <laughs> the porch. Um, so we really need to wait until we get the National Park Service, but, but you it should really be by August 27th. August 27th? Mm -hmm. That would be the 30 days that it outlined in the letter. Okay. From the but you really can't the design received. the building or anything about the worst scenario to me would be to repair the building and then find out you had to take it off. 
So obviously this has all got to be right. figured out way before you sit down and draw your plans. Correct. So you want it as quickly as we want it. <laughs> Absolutely. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Ron? I'm all set. Roger? Um, thank you. Um, I think uh, you've done a terrific job, and uh, I commend you for what you've done so far, and look forward to seeing this proceed. I'm all set. Thank you. Uh, I'm also happy with how this turned out and looking forward to seeing it come to fruition, and um, I'd like to also thank staff for working with the applicant on, <coughs> on the easement, but, but um, some of the traffic um, pattern issues and, and some of the other things that, that they worked through together. Um, with that, I really don't have anything else to, uh, to add, so I will put a motion forward. Move to approve the Avesta housing application for the Southgate House development at 577 Route 1 under Chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 406, the Scarborough Subdivision Ordinance, Chapter 405B, the Scarborough Site Plan Review Ordinance, and Chapter 405C, the Scarborough Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, with the following findings and conditions. Findings as presented. I will not read them all right now, but you'll you'll have those and they'll be part of the record. Conditions. Number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay traffic impact fees and execute and record the maintenance agreement required by the post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance. Number two, the site development is designed to preserve the identity of the Southgate House in its historic nature and integrity. However, the board finds that should the applicable historic preservation review agency require the removal of the front porch, such an amendment to the plan may be considered and approved by the planning department. Number three, final design of the Delta Island at the Route 1 access drive to be reviewed and approved by staff. And number four, a pre-construction meeting is required before start of construction. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and his contractor, the utility company representative, if applicable. The pre-construction meeting may be scheduled in coordination with the senior planner. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And good luck. Item number eight on our agenda, Risbera Brothers Construction Company requests final subdivision review for an amendment to the Thaburge subdivision for the addition of seven new residential lots. Assessor's map R40, lot one. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. As board members will recall, this <coughs> item was before you previously uh, and let's see, received a preliminary subdivision approval in, uh, on July 13th. Uh, the applicant has been working through um, staff and, and board comments since then and, and working to move towards final approval. There are still some issues that remain to be worked out uh, with regards to stormwater approach and some other design elements that need to be reviewed. Um, however, the applicant uh, wishes to proceed with a discussion with the board to talk about uh, be sure the board's comfortable with the direction that things are headed in terms of a few of those issues. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, Principal sort of Chief among those, and you will have received comments from Woodard and Kern as well as Angela Blanchett, the town's engineer, regarding uh, uh, stormwater um, uh, approaches to dealing with stormwater controls in terms of quality and quantity. Um, some of the other issues that the board had talked about previously with the applicant, and they're looking uh, for further discussion with the board in regards to um, uh, screening of the, uh, or buffering, I guess I should say, of the subdivision from the highway, as board members really call this, is runs close to the turnpike, um, as well as stormwater uh, buffering, uh, I, I'm sorry, wetland buffering and delineations. I, I guess I should have started out with a reminder to the board and, and members of the public that this is a, a subdivision within the R2 district um, and given the characteristics of the site, it does require to be a conservation subdivision design which um, requires a minimum of at least uh, 
40% of the open space to be remained as open space. Um, in this instance, it's 40% of open space because the applicant was unable to acquire a reasonable connection to a sewer connection, an item that the board worked its way through quite a bit. Um, and so with that, um, I'd also just note that the applicant is also still awaiting their DEP permits. Um, and so um, we hopefully will have those in time for our next review as well. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'd turn it back to you. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Ms. St. Clair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight with Rocky Risbear and my husband, David, uh, talking a little bit more with you folks about um, the submerged subdivision. This is the second amendment to this subdivision. It was originally approved back in 2002. Uh, as Jay had mentioned, we've been before you folks a few times. Uh, the latest was back in July uh, when uh, preliminary approval was granted. From a lot layout standpoint, from a road layout standpoint, really nothing much has changed uh, with regard to that from the July meeting. Uh, there have been a couple of lot line shifts, just a little bit of movement around, just to improve really building window envelopes uh, for each of the lots. The road has not changed in alignment uh, since you last saw it. One of the things that uh, we did talk uh, with you folks about uh, last time was the connectivity with the Bonnie Grove subdivision. That was something that we actually talked about, I think, at sketch level uh, to begin with on that. Uh, we had reached out to those folks. Um, there is a small strip of land between the end of the public right-of-way and the property line on Bonnie Grove, which is actually owned by the Homeowners Association. So the applicant had reached out to the Lot Owners Association to request two things, uh, and it was an either-or or both. Uh, one was a physical, uh, physical uh, connectivity to provide access uh, via Bonnie Grove Drive. The other was a utility access in order to provide a link to allow public sewer to be extended into the site. Um, both of those requests were denied. Uh, we've had a discussion with you folks about that. Uh, so as a result, our program was uh, required to move forward with septic systems on the lot. So we talked to you folks last time about a nitrate study and asked for a waiver uh, with regard to that. But our, our lots do have septic systems. As Jay mentioned, in the R2 district, we do have um, a sort of a relatively unique situation in that we're on septic systems, but we're in the R2. So from a conservation subdivision standpoint, our minimum lot sizes, our density requirements don't change, but there is the provision for the common open space. So uh, as Jay noted, that's 40% in this particular situation. We're actually providing about 54%. Uh, of open space as part of the project. And you can see that uh, on the plan. And actually on your plans, the, <coughs> the drawing actually goes further up. <laughs> the um, open space does extend a little bit further to the north uh, as well. So that whole northern tip of the site is part of the open space area. We did talk a little bit about the 25-foot uh, buffer around the open space. And I do want to talk to you folks in detail about that. And we'll get to that in just a, just a couple minutes. So <clears throat> as we mentioned, um, we had tried to get uh, connectivity and access uh, via Bonnie Grove. And so our layout uh, reflected the fact that we were not going to be able to have that access. As we've gone through the staff level review and as we've gone through uh, comments with regard to uh, different departments in the town as well as the Portland Water District, one of the recommendations that was made to us relatively recently, as a matter of fact, I think it probably came in after, uh, we submitted the plans to you, was to provide for a possible future utility connection into Bonnie Grove in the event that there is a need to either loop the water system or to provide some sort of municipal connection via utility, that our project provide that at least up to the common line with Bonnie Grove. We don't have that link. We, we don't control that but we have provided on our plans. And you'll see that on the rendering here, you'll see that it looks kind of an orange sort of L that goes along what would be the northerly side of uh, lots uh, 12 and 14, and then turns and makes an L to Bonnie Grove Drive uh, along that sideline. What we try to do with that is make that utility easement an option for the future in the event that the municipality does need to have some form of a link 
uh, for that. It runs coincident with the side yard setback on those lots. We've kind of come across, if you will, on the end of lot 12 because it does come to a point, excuse me, lot 14 because it does come to a point. And then we've run a 15-foot strip up the side to come to the end of Bonnie Grove Drive, and you'll see that on those plans. So the other part of that easement, because we do provide a 30-foot easement along that, that northerly edge, does overlap with that 25-foot buffer. And so we wanted to talk to you folks about that when we met with staff. Um, that seems to be something that would be workable in that it does provide at least some opportunity in the future if a need arises for that. It's not to serve any benefit for our project. We stand alone. But if there is ever anything from a municipal standpoint that needs to happen, that area uh, is located there. So this 25-foot um, upland buffer from the wetlands is something that Jay and I have talked a bit about, and we wanted to kind of go over the details of it, talk to you folks about it, and get your thoughts on uh, the uses that can be appropriate in those areas. If you look at our plan, you'll see that there's looks kind of like a green. Oh, yeah. Hopefully this is on. <laughs> if you look at our plan, there's this line here. The wetlands on this site are very jagged. You might want to flip it over. Yeah. The wetlands on this line are very jagged. Mm -hmm. So to provide a 25-foot buffer and provide that all along the edges, you end up with sort of this shape as we've shown on the plan. The, there is obviously upland areas here that would be part of the open space that would be part of that area. But this provides basically from the high points or the peaks of that rather jagged shape. If you recall from our prior discussions, one of the things that we had asked for was given the fact that it does have such an erratic shape along there, that there be an opportunity at least to share part of our setback with um, that 25-foot buffer. So if you look closely at the plans, you'll see <coughs> that there's an area in here on lot 11. There's an area in here on lot 12. And there's a very small area here and here on 14. With the addition of the utility corridor, this orangey area, or pink area, if you will, here, again, those overlap in pieces. We pulled back the lot window on lot 14, so it's basically on the uphill side of where that utility corridor would be and outside of that buffer in its entirety. The buffer in this area here does overlap with the side yard setback. We took a look at the grading that we anticipate for the house on this particular lot. And we believe that we can maintain that buffer as its natural state without having to do any regrading in that particular area. If a utility line has to come through at some point in the future as a result of a municipal need, then obviously that area would have to be at least temporarily impacted uh, in order to do that. <coughs> the question arises with this lot, lot 11. We're very tight. The grades drop off in that particular area, and we do anticipate that as part of the construction of the house, there's probably going to be about a 50 to maybe 60 foot segment of that overlap where we would need to do grading in order to construct this house. The remainder of that upland buffer, we expect that we can maintain in its natural state. But we do need to have some latitude in this particular area right here as it's the tightest point. On that particular lot, <coughs> the soils that are suitable for a septic system are right in this location here. To try to move the house closer here to pull it away from there, we can't get a driveway past that septic system location. So that's sort of the background and the reasoning for the request to have that particular area be allowed to at least be reworked during the construction of the house. What we had proposed to do is to provide pins along these areas where it overlaps 
into the site so that there would be a clearly denoted point on the lot as to where uh, that buffer would be. If you also remember, there was a discussion about pinning some of the wetland areas, and those are shown on the plan as well, with proposed pins around the corners of the building envelope on the lots where we have wetlands proximate to uh, the home. So those are wetland pins. These would be wetland buffer pins in this area here. So we wanted to talk to you a little bit about that in particular uh, to make sure that the board was comfortable with that. Uh, and to discuss if there's any alternatives uh, that might be appropriate for that. <coughs> Actually, while I'm right here. One of the other comments that we received was with regard to this small strip of wetland that connects between this area here and the larger open space area. Jay had asked that we provide for a little bit of buffering along here, so we've actually pulled the building envelope back in that location to maintain an approximately five, excuse me, ten foot setback from uh, this area here. What this plan uh, also will show, <coughs> show right now, will is the same thing on the opposite side, so that we have basically that whole corridor is protected on either side. By doing that, it will allow someone if they need to put a shed on their lot as long as it's outside of this area here and not impacting that, it will provide a little bit more uh, buffering for that link uh, in that location as well. Jay mentioned the discussion about noise abatement uh, in the discussion, particularly with regard to the turnpike. This was something that had come up a while ago um, and actually was a response to some comments that we received from the folks who live in the existing part of Memory Lane and their concern about our work, whether we were going to create clearing that was going to have the potential to increase um, the noise from the turnpike. So if you recall from the site walk, there's some nice pines out on that property. And so what the applicant had proposed as part of the submittal that you have uh, is to actually transplant a number of those pines, about six to eight inch diameter pines. We had proposed on the original plan in this location here, eight trees to be transplanted from the development area. If you look on the plan here, you can see that there's a number of them here and in this area that unfortunately would end up being impacted as part of the development of the project. So we're looking to relocate those and to provide a buffer along this area here. If you remember from being out on the site, there is an open area right in this location here uh, that these trees would fit nicely into. We've set those aside. We've actually added two more. So this plan reflects that there's 10 that are proposed uh, to be relocated. And those would augment there's four that are out in that area now. So those, there would be a total of 14 uh, trees in that location. This darker band that you see along the edges on the back side of these three lots, that's a proposed no-cut buffer. So once those trees are transplanted into that area, we will provide a section that's probably on the order of about 50 feet from the back property line uh, to that area that would become a no-cut buffer. One of the last comments that we received was to provide for provisions for the maintenance of these trees, making sure that they were viable once they got transplanted. So we do have a note on the plan that indicates that for one year, the applicant will monitor and maintain the trees to ensure the viability. Um, if something happens, they don't live for that year, then they will be replaced as part of a guarantee on the transplanted trees, similar to a landscape plan where the plant materials are guaranteed uh, for a period of a year. So <coughs> that's what we're proposing to do in this area here. The trees are planted in the open area. There are still some wooded areas that are on the back side that would not be uh, cut as part of the no cut buffer. Uh, and then remember that we do have <coughs> a wetland that comes down through uh, in this area here that also uh, would be precluded from further impact uh, in that area. And getting down into this area, one of the other things I did want to point out to you folks is this strip which shows up on the plan and was discussed in the application materials that we filed with you. Uh, we have been contacted by the Maine Turnpike Authority they would like to be able to connect from the turnpike 
to two rod roads with a maintenance road. <coughs> it's gated. It provides an opportunity for the Turnpike Authority to have access in the event of an emergency and during their winter maintenance so that the plow trucks would have a key and be able to get in. And it, uh, from what I understand, it prevents them from having to do a loop where they have to cross the median, and it also prevents overlap and so it's fuel. So as I understand it, public safety, uh, state police would also have a key uh, for that area, but other than that, it's a closed and gated uh, section. So this area right here, based on the information that we were provided by the Turnpike Authority, is the area that they'd like to have. Um, so we have taken that out of our density calculations. We've shown it on the plan as an area to be conveyed uh, to the Turnpike Authority. Uh, it doesn't affect this lot, and it doesn't affect the overall density of the project. So we are proposing that as part of our plan. So <coughs> as Jay had mentioned to you, uh, we are here tonight to have some further discussions with you of a number of the items that we talked about, but also a couple of other things. Uh, one is with regard to stormwater. And uh, we had provided a, a calculations and, and design plans that had basically an open swale system along the sides of the road, very similar to the first phase of memory lane. In talking with staff and uh, reviewing the plans, one of the uh, requests is that we provide some additional means for water quality enhancement as part of that program. And so what you'll see on that plan, you see sort of four little red blobs, if you will, <laughs> along the side of the road. Those are actually four proposed grassed under drain soil filters. Those would uh, take the place of the open ditches and the culverts. They would provide for an opportunity to collect and provide some treatment uh, for runoff from the road and the, the driveways uh, in the project. As part of our application materials that you have before you, we had also provided roof drip line BMPs so that all the houses would have uh, treatment provided for their roof runoff uh, as part of the plan. So as Jay noted, this is something that has sort of come out relatively recently with regard to that, and staff does need to uh, review and coordinate with us to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, with regard to that. But that is our proposal and our program uh, to provide some additional water quality benefits and BMPs uh, on the site for that. They would discharge at the same location that we have on our plans. We have two uh, level spreaders at the end of the road, and they would discharge at the same point there. Uh, so we're looking at being able to provide a relatively low key, if you will, uh, means for some stormwater treatment on the site. They would be either within the right-of-way or within a drainage easement immediately adjacent to the right-of-way. Uh, so that's our, our program uh, with regard to that. So the other item that um, we wanted to talk to you just briefly about is with regard to our state level permitting. We are awaiting our permit, and that is why we are here to get input from you folks, but do recognize that we uh, have to have our permits in hand before we can actually seek final approval. Our goal would be to have all of the items outlined, as we've discussed tonight, any comments that you have addressed so that uh, by the time the permits do come in, it could be a consent item. That's where we're at. Thank you. Ron, would you like to start? I guess. <laughs> I'm not going to say that I followed all of that, Nancy, because I would be lying through my teeth. But I do have uh, some questions. Uh, as far as the landscaping, uh, and I just I guess for Jay, she, she mentioned a one-year maintenance. Is, is uh, How does that like you. Is that ordinary? Is it out of whack with? No, I think that's, you know, as part of the performance guarantee, that's certainly something that the town could administer. Um, so it uh, doesn't sound too out of whack. But one that's year is all right, just for one year? Mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, uh, relocating large trees, and so that's certainly a question we could look into as to what the appropriate time frame be, might be. Is it one year or two years? Um, uh, staff could certainly reach out to others who have more knowledge in that field. Um, 
to be sure we're doing adequate time frame on that. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my only other concern, Nancy, is is that I know you met with the town engineer and you met with the representative for Wooden Wood Wood Wooden Common, right? Yes. And their comments. And my, my question, one of my questions is, is, does the Army Corps of Engineers have to get involved in this? They're already reviewing it. That's one of the things that we're waiting for as part of our state permit. It's a joint permit between the DEP and the Corps. Okay, so so the, the comments that I have in front of me as far as the uh, the <coughs> culverts are concerned, how many, where, so forth, you're waiting to get feedback from them. We've actually coordinated with the Corps on that. Uh, we expect that based on their comments, based on uh, the Corps has some condition criteria, that there's probably going to be two culverts and they are going to be depressed. So they'll actually be the invert of the culvert will be below grade and they'll be about six inches below grade and that will allow anything that's in the wetland to crawl through if it wants to, that type of thing. And you'll share that with us when you get your finals? Yep. Okay. Um, in, the, in the big picture, um, um, from what you discussed and what, what I've seen myself on, on the site visit, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Roger? Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> just two questions. Um, that easement between lots 12 and 13, I'm looking here. It looks like it just goes to lot 14. Does it go? It must go across 14 somewhere. Is that correct? No, that is actually an easement to allow the services for the house on lot 14. Oh, okay. And it's just it's a straighter shot. It's a simpler shot to bring the utilities right to that house in that location, as opposed to coming up the driveway. Oh, okay. So I thought that was designed for a future possible okay. connection with Bonnie. No. Okay. Um, well, where is that then? Because you did talk about that. That's the, um, if you look on this plan here, <coughs> here's the end of the right-of-way of Memory Lane. Yeah. We're offering it as a public street so the municipal ownership would end right there as upon acceptance. We have this band that comes across here. It's 30 feet wide, comes up to the property line, and then is 15 feet wide to the common line with the Bonnie Grove property. Okay. That piece that I, w I mentioned to you, that sort of that gap, is right here. Okay. Uh, the last question is on the um, the transfer to the uh, Main Turnpike Authority. Yes. Is, is there going to be any kind of buffering, or is that just going to be a chain chain linked enclosure by the MTA, and or what's what, how's that going to be set up? I mean. I don't know what their specifics of their design would be. They've asked us to provide the strip of land. I would expect that whatever is appropriate with the uh, Turnpike Authority for the review with you folks uh, would happen, and they would provide details for what would happen in that strip. Okay. Well said. Thanks, Roger. Isn't that a feeling you may have an opinion on the landscape guarantee? Um, I think it does need to be researched. I'm done a lot of work with white pine because everybody has white pine and you stick a little white pine in the ground and pretty soon you've got a really big white pine. It doesn't take very long. They also start to fall apart at the bottom. So pretty soon, I mean, they have no understory. So it's a really good, quick answer. I don't think it's any long-term answer to the, but <laughs> I've been hanging around here long enough that this is how I'm starting to think, okay? Those trees are going to provide plenty of protection while people get used to living there, and then they're not going to hear it anymore. So by the time the lowest part of those trees fall off, people won't even be aware that the turnpike is there anymore, so I don't have any problems with it. I think a year is fine. I do have a question about the letter, that memorandum that was sent from Angela Blanchett. I'd like to meet Angela. She has such a lovely name. Um, <clears throat> about the um, uh, wastewater, water treatment, water. This whole thing is just so com complex and confusing. This water has quality? been covered yes. by what it was you just explained to us. Correct. Thank you. See. 
I basically have faith in all parts of uh, the way this system works. You know, it's just every once in a while I just kind of can't quite remember how it comes together. I think there's been an enormous amount of work done on this, and um, as I'm fond of saying, whenever I get an opportunity, all the good land's gone. All the easy stuff has been used up. So we're going to see more and more and more of this kind of thing. And the good news is that we really did our homework, folks. We created really good ordinances before we got to the point where this is what we were facing. Sometimes we knew we were doing it on purpose. Sometimes it just kind of happened. But I would just like to have go on record as saying I think the town is in pretty good shape for the shape it's in to be able to take something like this because this is incredibly demanding. And the applicant has done far-reaching efforts. And we didn't, even though I wanted to, I didn't just stand there and laugh. You've got to be kidding me. And look what you've done. So I think it's great. I look forward to what we, go, what we do next. And you're just going to sit there waiting for all these things to come in the mail. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? Yeah, I have. Um, I just have one question. It was from the Wooden Kern. And it, uh, it outlined here that says it does not appear. <coughs> Excuse me. That sufficient access will be provided for maintenance of the storage filter system isolator roll. Has that been addressed with what you just presented tonight? Um, I don't think we're reviewing this project. <laughs> well, that'd be very embarrassing, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, I have to use the restroom. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they're all lumped in here. I'm sorry. Um, you're right. That is not your issue this evening. So I am out of questions. Good luck. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as discussed, there's really not a whole lot that's new here. I do appreciate, I think we all appreciate the, the thorough update. Um, I'm not hearing, I haven't heard any particular concerns about the, the notion of having the overlap uh, with the, the buffer and the setback in certain locations, and I don't think I have an issue with it uh, necessarily, provided that things are, are, you know, that's kept to a minimum and that things are adequately marked. Um, beyond that, I guess we'll uh, look forward to uh, to hearing that you've gotten your, your state level permits and we'll, we'll talk about final approval. Um, I do want to say I also appreciate the all the time and effort that went into this on the part of the applicant and the and staff. Um, and then it's sort of a quick aside on the, it's interesting, interesting little tidbit about the Turnpike Authority. And I would imagine, in my time on the board, I don't think I've ever seen the Turnpike Authority in front of us, but I would imagine that to the extent they would come in front of us, it would be similar to um, some of the utility presentations we've seen where there's really not a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> whole lot that we can do. I guess I would just say, for the record, I, I would hope that any any abutters who might potentially be affected directly or indirectly would be notified through whatever the proper channels are. And it's obviously not your issue, but I'm glad that you uh, informed us about it. Um, so beyond that, I guess we'll look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully soon. Thank you very much. With regard to the overlap of the buffer, I would it be appropriate that we work with Jay and come up with some notations for the plan that sort of itemizes that? That would be appropriate. I would be comfortable with that, and, and unless anyone else has a comment on that, I think that's a fine approach. No, I have a question regarding the Turnpike Authority. I'm just kind of curious. Did they come to you and say, we want that land? or? <laughs> yes, they did. So you had no choice? No, they didn't. No, um, we weren't ordered, but... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there really is no other word for it. They didn't you couldn't refuse. <laughs> They're going to put a, um express toll booth right there, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I asked specifically what the use was for. <laughs> All right. Okay. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. As mentioned previously, item number nine was tabled. Uh, so item number 10, BBS Enterprises requests site plan review for 62 Muzzy Road Asian Fusion Restaurant, Assessor's Map R37, Lot 38. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let's see, board members may recall this item was before you back in, geez, I think, believe it was January of this year um, for a sketch plan review. Um, the applicant has obviously um, been working on their plans since that time, 
And as mentioned, they are um, looking for a multi-use development of a t uh, parcel in the TVC3 district. Um, the principal use of the parcel is going to be for a restaurant, but they are also seeking to convert an existing farmhouse into some office space. Um, that is one of the sort of key characteristics of this site. The applicant is looking to repurpose the existing farmhouse and barn on the site um, into, as I just mentioned, that office space and some accessory area, as well as establish a 5,000 square foot restaurant, which is the maximum size a restaurant can be in the TVC3 district. As board members will note, the site application uh, is required to go through our site plan review ordinance. Um, you will have received comments from uh, Woodard and Kern, as well as Angela Blanchett. Um, also, Goral Palmer has conducted a peer review of the traffic uh, aspects, in addition to staff comments. Um, I should also note that this application has been through our pre-application review process. So they have received at least one round of staff peer review comments to which they were able to um, make some amendments before they came back to the board uh, for this review. Um, so to that end, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, you have a host of staff comments. One of the um, critical uh, review elements that I think we need to discuss tonight has to do with site access. There's really two principal waivers that the applicant is seeking. Um, one is for driveway separation from the abutting access drive to the east. Um, which is the uh, location of creative imaging. Uh, it's uh, shown on your, on your plans as JCA Holdings. And the other is for offset separation from Honan Road. Um, our ordinance tries to line up intersections as much as possible. Um, the applicant, I'm sure, is prepared to describe why they've presented the, the current location. But um, those are two elements that uh, staff comments and uh, Goral Palmer have weighed in on. Um, some other issues that we touch on um, are with regards to um, pedestrian ways, landscaping. Um, one, there seemed to be a, maybe a bit of disconnect between the landscape plans and engineering plans in terms of maybe where snow storage might be and some type of plantings that were uh, proposed. So just some details to be worked through, uh, details in terms of lighting. Uh, another uh, item that we didn't, weren't able to find on the plans was uh, in terms of any air handling units for the restaurant. Um, certainly we typically see a number of air handling units, chillers, con condensers that are associated with restaurants, so we really want to be sure we're adequately identifying those as part of this process um, and screening them as necessary. Um, and then finally, as I noted, uh, you know, design standards certainly are applicable here. Uh, the design standards really talk about when a site has existing buildings, really working to complement those buildings. Um, this is an, an older farmhouse and barn. It's not listed on one of the towns uh, on the historic preservation list, but it's certainly an older um, uh, structures on site. And the applicant has uh, uh, an architect on board who's worked to um, as I say, sort of complement that, and that's, uh, hopefully the board has an opportunity to review that and provide their comments in that regards. Um, I guess the other thing I just note is that <coughs> the applicant is still awaiting their DEP permit, so they're aware they need to have that in hand prior to any final approvals, but um, tonight's a good opportunity for the board and applicant to discuss any final issues or directions that they may be headed to be sure the board's generally comfortable. So with that, I will hand it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jake, and I'll hand it off to you, Mr. Allen. Great. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, my name is Lee Allen with Northeast Civil Solutions. I'm joined tonight by Mike Richmond from Custom Concepts, the architect on the project. And just wanted to hit on some of the items that Jay had mentioned. Um, first of all, is we are asking for two waivers. One is the driveway separation. Um, as you'll note, where the lot is, our driveway is very close to that of the Creative Imaging Building. Um, the traffic light that's out there, are, for our lot, lot, it's most conducive or safest to have the driveway as far away from that light as possible, which puts us in close proximity to the creative imaging driveway. Um, back at the beginning of the project, we did actively seek out um, creative imaging folks and see if we could work out some sort of shared driveway agreement. Um, if you recall, I think we discussed this at the sketch plan that just it did not work. We tried everything. It did not work. So we then looked at separating the driveways and making them individual. Um, that's where we ended up. 
Um, so we are seeking a waiver for the driveway separation. Our traffic engineer, uh, Bill Bray, has looked at the driveway separation and based on the amount of traffic coming in and out does not see any problem with that based on the relatively low volume of traffic we have coming in and out of the driveway during the peak hour. Uh, the second waiver we're seeking is the offset separation of our driveway relative to Honan Road, which is located across Muzzy Road from us. Um, there is a slight offset, but thankfully it's in the correct location for left turns. Um, Honan Road is a residential dead-end road with uh, 10 homes on it. Um, we've actually looked at the potential for developing Honan Road further. Um, the maximum potential for Honan Road is maybe another two or three homes at most. We looked at potentially wrapping that around and tying it back into Muzzy Road. There's a large wetland out there which is kind of stalled development on any future growth of taking Honan Road and wrapping it around to, to Muzzy Road. So there would not be any additional traffic from Honan Road. With that, um, Bill Bray has written a letter. You don't have a copy of it. Uh, it just came in that says this is a, a safe separation based on the, the offset. If the offset was in the opposite direction, it would be a, a different, um, it, would, it would be a lot worse for us. But in this, this way, it's still safe. Uh, so you'll be receiving, or the board, I mean, the staff will be receiving a, a letter to that effect supporting that waiver request. Uh, there's also a comment that we meet with the DOT, I mean, the fire department for <coughs> fire lanes. Um, we've already met with the fire department. This building will be sprinkled. Um, since it's being sprinkled, their um, concerns over fire lanes were diminished. They're, they're satisfied with the lot layout, but we'll certainly touch base with them with, again with this new layout. We changed the parking a bit, as you might recall from the last time that we were in the board. It was, it was orientated differently. We had to change it to, uh, to meet the requirements of the seating that we were trying to get in the restaurant. So. That's kind of how we ended up with that. Uh, snow storage. Um, there's a stream that runs on our property line to the south and west of our site, which kind of forces all our development kind of to the middle and our parking way over to the edge. So there's not a ton of room for snow storage. There is some. We're trying to keep that other space, you know, useful landscape. So our plan is that there's limited snow storage on the site, and once that is filled, then the um, excess snow will be trucked off. Um, that's similar to a lot of urban settings, certainly around Scarborough and South Portland and Portland. Drainage system. Um, we are still waiting for DEP permits. DEP, we have a stormwater <coughs> permit that we're trying to get from the DEP as well as an NRPA permit for our wetland fill. We've met with the DEP on site, and one of the, their suggestions was, is like, hey, there's a drainage line that runs down Muzzy Road. Instead of discharging into the brook, why don't you discharge into an existing municipal drain line. We're like, hey, that's a great idea. So we went back and forth with Angela. There's requirements the town's put on us to fulfill, such as cameraing the line, making sure it's in good condition before we tie into it, um, meeting with Angela out there, meeting with Mike Shaw, the public works director out there, to make sure the 36-inch culvert that runs under Muzzy Road is also in good condition. And then we have some drainage analysis to do to make sure we're not going to flood out the, the lines. And all those need to be met and will be put on the plan to be met as part of this. But that um, saves, you know, an open pipe discharge into that brook, which everybody agrees is a good, a good thing. Um, HVAC is brought up. Um, we will need some HVAC. It will be pad mounted. It will be outside. Um, we're looking towards the rear of the site, towards the parking out near the dumpster. Um, and that's something we know we need to add um, before we bring this plan back to you, um, hopefully in, in three weeks. Um, and as far as the DEP goes, with our constant communication with them. They are good with what we've done so far. They're ready to sign off on the permit. We've just added and sent them in some additional information this morning. Uh, we're anticipating a permit from them in the next week or two weeks. So that would be prior to the next meeting. Um, with that, before we get to questions, I want to turn it over to Mike. He has some uh, architectural things to go over. Good evening, Mike Richmond, Custom Concepts Architecture. Uh, I think my portion's quite easy tonight compared to Lee. Uh, the architecture and signage, which is brought up in the staff review, uh, that's our next step. We've shown a little bit of signage, a proposed signage attached to the building. Um, our next step is to take that a little bit further, do some sort of a monument side out by the road, and of course that will meet the 
sign regulations, and, and we can go over that. Uh, comment about the the use or the proposed use of stonework on the base of the columns for the for the addition for the restaurant portion of the building. Uh, it's a great point, and it brought up a conversation in my office about coming up with a, a stone that goes with the brick. The whole idea of the fusion is for us to sort of blend the new with the old, and it's part of the whole concept of the site inside and out. Um, so we're really not in tune with just using a lot more brick because there's a lot of it there, and that's old. So what we're going to do is try to find a stone that has that same sort of linear pattern, you know, obviously a different color, it would still be dark, um, but have sort of the same texture that the brick would. So we'll propose that as well during the next round. And other than that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Uh, before we go to board discussion, we do have the opportunity for a public comment. So if there's anyone who'd like to come on up and introduce themselves, feel free. Just please provide your name and address. Sure. Matthew Winch, I'm here on behalf of uh, the Butter JCA Holdings, uh, right next door to the uh, east of the subject property. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the only comment we have is uh, just with respect to the uh, snow removal. Um, on the plan indicated and discussed the snow storage areas that have been proposed. They are rather small in nature, which brings forth a concern as in Abutter, the parking aisle along the eastern uh, side of the property, along that uh, abutting line with 64 Muzzy Road. There's a possibility for snow to be pushed across the parking lot into um, 64 Muzzy Road. There are a series of trees that were a requirement of this planning board back in 2009 when that uh, 64 Muzzy Road property was developed. Uh, at the time, it was a residential uh, dwelling unit, so the uh, landscaping was required as a visual buffer uh, for lighting levels as well as uh, uh, the separations between a commercial use and a residential use. Um, now that this is converted to a uh, commercial uh, use adjacent to it, the uh, planting doesn't necessarily have the same import that it uh, uh, once did, but it's there, it's healthy, it's thriving. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, in that narrow buffer uh, between the, uh, the curbing and the property line, uh, something is done to perhaps uh, protect those trees on the abutting property. Other than that, uh, as the applicant uh, uh, or as their representatives have mentioned, uh, the plan has come a long way uh, from uh, what was proposed in sketch plan uh, back in November, I believe. Um, it's a, a, a great improvement. Uh, shared access was not something that uh, the abutter was interested in at that time, and this is seen as a, a, a great, vast improvement uh, over that initial uh, sketch plan submittal. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? <coughs> All right. If done, we will turn it over to the board. And Susan, would you like to start? Yay. A restaurant. You tell us is one of my favorite topics. We so desperately need restaurants in Scarborough. This is really good news. Um, so the existing house is going to be used as rental for office space. It will be used for office space, whether it's rented office space or office space used by one of the ventures that BBS has. It remains to be seen. But yes, it will be approximately 2,300 square feet of office space on the second floor. What are we going to do with the barn? The barn is going to be picked up and moved. And then when it re reaches its new home? It is. Parts of the interior will become parts of the coolers for the refrigerators and freezers for the restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, the remaining portion <coughs> is storage for some of the outdoor seating stuff in the wintertime. You can get it's a lot of outdoor seating in a barn that size. But it's all going to be pushed inside, the umbrellas, that sort of thing. Right. Okay. Um, it's a shame that the shared driveway didn't work, but on the other hand, what would you have done for parking? Oh, it would have been similar. I mean, you have all that parking beside the driveway. Right, which is something that was was it was always going to be there, probably would have been less 
with a shared driveway, to be frank. I think so, too, yeah. Um, I don't have any real problems with this. Um, I think that there are questions that have been asked and that are being looked at by various and sundry and sun, sundry and you know, speak engineers. But I'm just really pleased that it's coming. Um, it's interesting to me that Route One, okay, has been the focus for so long, and now we've got Dunstan and what's going on down there, and now we're moving up towards the Payne Road and down Muzzy Road. It's um, starting to come together, isn't it? It's all very interesting, and we're very pleased to have this here. I don't have any questions or problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fellows, if, if I might, may I just jump on a comment that Ms. Oglis just mentioned about the barn? Because that was certainly an area of discussion that staff and the applicant went around on quite a bit. Um, we did echo, I think, some of the concerns I was hearing in Ms. Oglis' uh, comments about the use of the barn. Really being sure, because part of the issue with the TVC3 is it limits restaurant to no more than 5,000 square feet. I believe the restaurant area that is depicted with the coolers inside that barn is 4,998 square feet. I mean, they were with a big old barn left over, <laughs> with about 2,000 feet of barn left or something to that effect. And it was, well, you know, what is this? And so we had to just be sure that we were being consistent. and. The applicant has provided, and it's been reviewed by the zoning administrator, planning staff, a letter talking about how the barn is going to be an accessory use. And when staff looked at that, given that the, the they're trying to repurpose the existing barn, so again, though it's not on our historic preservation list of properties, it is certainly um, the site is an older farmhouse site. And so repurposing that barn and we've actually had the applicant provide a, excuse me, note on the plan that really stipulates that, you know, it can really only be, I guess my point is typically if this were a clean, a vacant site and they were requesting 2,000 plus square feet of accessory use area, there might be some more question or hesitation on, on staff's um, part, but, and this is where, you know, being sure that the board's comfortable with the fact that we're repurposing existing structures on the site, staff, you know, felt comfortable forwarding this to the board um, in, in that light. So, um, I appreciate that because I knew I was concerned about it for some reason, mm -hmm. and um, I'm one of those people who says, okay, so this is going to be a very successful restaurant. If it is not a very successful restaurant and something else comes along to use that space, does the barn as an accessory use go with it? Yes. Yes. So it would be tricky, wouldn't it, to try to figure out what an accessory use would be for somebody else who took over that space. I mean, I just, I'm just seeing that this could be – there's a difference between looking at a particular applicant doing a particular thing and looking at planning for the – for the property, and I just want to make sure that this is all going to come together. And I think, you know, we can maybe think about that concern in, in terms of requiring any change of use to come back Good to this point. board. Mm -hmm. That could be a standing condition that just goes with this property I in think perpetuity. It has to. That's so a, yeah. maybe that's, that's a, a way. It's a logical thing yeah. to do, isn't it? And I agree with you, with Susan. That's a great point, and that we do make that a condition. Okay, and and honestly, from our point of view, I thought that coming back for any change of use was implied that we had to do that anyway based under the standard conditions of approval. Well, I think you do. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, so there was a question that there was borough people refused to answer for me. It's because it wasn't for them. That worked for Rich Vera. It was for you, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin. So, that being said, have you addressed that the issue of the uh, access, the limited access to the... Um, I'll pull it back up. <laughs> so you... It's, up, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a, on the back page of the Risborough. Anyways. <laughs> does not appear that sufficient access will be provided for maintenance of the storage filter system isolator row. Has that been addressed? It has not yet, but it was is coming. So the issue here, and we run into this a lot, we do a lot of these underground systems, is that the isolator row typically accumulates the bulk of the sediment in these underground storage systems. 
and what we do to get access to them instead of the measly little inspection ports, which a lot of people try to get away with, is we try to do drain manholes at either end so that you can get in from either end and jet, jet from one end and suck out the other end. Um, we've done that in the past on other projects that we've used in the northern and central parts of Maine, and that's been very effective. So that's our plan to move forward with this, is to add drain manholes at either end to gain access to the isolated row. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that was from that. Uh, and this is just out of curiosity. I mean, I think the plan in itself is, um, I think you're making good use of the, of the space. Um, had there been consideration to trying to curve that driveway so it met up a little bit better with, you know, Honan, or did you, were you constrained by, you know, the building yeah. setbacks? It's, it's, um, exactly. Yeah. The issue was we tr we looked at bringing it closer to the building. I mean, we had it almost touching, and that just, I mean, we were so close. We're like, snowplow's going to come through and take out the corner of the building. So we're right now five feet away with a sidewalk in between, which we feel is as close as we want to get. Okay. Um, we did. We looked at it. We talked. Bill Bray was actually involved with the design and layout of this, and said, "Bill, is this going to be a problem? Look, look at all this that's going on." And he said, "Let me think about it." He thought about it, and he said, "No, based on the, the amount of traffic in here, the traffic here, based on the traffic here, this this is not an issue. This is going to be safe." Okay. And and I appreciate that. Um, so, um, to answer your request for an answer regarding your waivers. Um, my feelings, I wrote them down. One was on the intersection offset, correct? Correct. I would be okay with that. And the second one was the the distance between the two driveways right. being less than minimum. I am okay with that, um, just so you have my thoughts on that. Um, as far as snow removal, I mean, yeah, you've got a big parking lot, and it's going to accumulate a lot of snow. Yep. So maintenance is really critical to this. Um, yep. And I think your butter brings up a good point. I don't think we need to dump piles of snow onto his property either. So I, I think, like I said, maintenance is going to be critical to how you handle this. Um, and I'm not sure what the recourse is if, if it's not done well. Um, so you know, anything you can say to me right now to make me feel a little bit better about how well you remove snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the one thing is um, with our landscape plan, you can see that there are some additional tree plantings, and this um, will help with us not pushing snow up that far. Um, we, we just have to be cognizant of it. The owner has to be cognizant of understanding he has a neighbor. Um, there are this row of trees that were planted by the abutter. I mean, we're sensitive to that. And that's why we're saying, you know, we don't have a lot of room on this site to store snow, so it's going to be critical that when they're full, they're going to have to remove snow. And that's something a lot of the urban businesses in the middle of on Route 1 do. So. I think that's all I have for right now. Thank you. And I also noted that Susan is also okay with the waiver request. Record. Ron? How many parking spaces? 74. And is that what's necessary to meet the ordinance? Correct. Because one of the recommendations to follow up on what Nick was just getting at is to reduce the amount of yep. spaces for the snow. Yep. I understand. We've looked at that. We've thought about that. Um, if you'll recall, in one of the past projects we did down off of Royal Ridge Road, we we did just that. We we had future spaces to be used there. Uh, we think this is different. We think the the office use is going to coincide with the restaurant use. In which case, you're going to need all the parking spots between say 11 and 4 o'clock. You know, granted, there's going to be some extras after 4 and before 11, but <coughs> between that time, that's probably the peak time with the parking area was going to be full when both the office use and the restaurant use are both at their max. What about pedestrian movement? That was another comment that I read in the package. Yeah, so this is, that's a good question. Um, I can't remember if it was Jay or if it was Dan, but at some point somebody had approached us with the need or the want for an easement across the front for a future sidewalk along Muzzy Road. I don't know if that rings a bell with anybody, but I do remember that conversation. I just don't remember with who I had it. Yeah, I think, you know, I'll just chime in. Typically, um, it, our site plan review ordinance, uh, TVC3 in particular, really seeks to, you know, this is a, identified as sort of a village context trying to uh, uh, prepare for and allow for uh, pedestrian movements. 
And typically our site plan review uh, or site plan ordinance seeks to have a sidewalk along the frontage um, of a site. <coughs> However, um, you know, in often cases where the town has plans and has identified an area for need of sidewalk, we've had applicants build the sidewalk even though they may not in the short term connect, but over long term we see those connections made and there's a number of examples of that that have been recently completed. Um, However, this is a location where the town doesn't currently have any pedestrian plans long term. Um, and so in those type of scenarios, uh, the board has um, recently gone to at least acquiring a 10-foot access, uh, uh, um, easement access to be able to get in, construct, maintain, and utilize a sidewalk should that ever come to fruition. Um, and so that's really what's being sought at this time. Um, so, so that may not be right. It may not be shown on the plan, but we are, are certainly in the position that we are. You know, the trees that are along the front of that building will be coming down. It's a site mm -hmm. distance issue right now, so that opens up some room, and we're, we're certainly willing to give that easement across the front of the property. Um, and what that means, we should take our existing sidewalk and extend it out there. So then, in the future, there is a connection. Mm -hmm. Whenever that may be, then then maybe we should be adding that to our plan. Yep. Yeah, and, and typically what we have, um, Lee, is just sort of a dash line yep. that does just say, you know, easement area to be conveyed to town right. or something. Like that. You know, I would not expect a sidewalk based on what the area is. Um, next, lighting. I haven't heard anything. Have you got anything yet? For we, we have lighting plans for the parking. We honestly hadn't done any for the outdoor seating area as we assumed each table would have the light on it and that we didn't think we needed much more. Um, reading the comments, I, I saw that comment and um, was going to refer that back to our lighting designer and see what he had to say about that. And then one of the other comments is the patio and the connection of the patio. Yeah, and that's something we will do. That's a, that's a safety issue of, get, of getting people, if there's an issue with the building you need to get out some way, there needs to be a connection to that back parking area past the dumpster. And uh, just as an aside, Lee, I'm also in favor of the two exceptions. Then my final comments um, uh, uh, on the basis of Angela's comments to you, and I mm -hmm. won't read them because it's, you know, don't need to, but she seems to be pretty uh, insistent on the fact that uh, that the town engineer and public works director and everybody meet prior to mm -hmm. final, uh, you know, yep. Are you okay with that? Yeah, so just so that Angela and I came up with that criteria actually together. We talked about what we thought was fair and what was right. Um, we agreed. Um, we have a, a, an outfit going to TV the line, I believe, on Wednesday. So we should have the video back on that by the beginning of next week. And then um, I believe Mike Shaw will be available. And then the, the three of us will meet on site. And, and that should put this issue to, to bed at that point. And, and of course, also the sanitary district, you'll get a permit from them, right? That's in process. I believe that that meeting is coming right up. Okay. Um, let me go on record as saying I look really look forward to the restaurant. I agree with Susan. We, we need some additional restaurants based on the uh, developments going in and an increase in population and everything else. So I think it hopefully it will be a welcome addition. But I'm glad she picked up on the fact that if it doesn't work out, there'd be the stipulation that a new entity would have to come back to yeah. the board. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Roger? All right, thank you. <coughs> um, actually, I was going to ask a question similar to what Nick uh, asked about the Abutta and the snow situation. Uh, but one thing the uh, gentleman there mentioned when he was up there, um, he made a comment about <coughs> the uh, joint road mm -hmm. driveway. And he, and I may have misread what you, what you said, but he sort of implied that the, when, when the plans were first presented, uh, they weren't that impressed with it, and so therefore they weren't interested in a, in a joint driveway. But I'm just wondering if that, if that, if there's any possibility of that <laughs> with, the, no. with these changed plans, because I, I've, is, I've talked to the owner. Yeah, I could, there's no chance. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I, I thought I, I sensed maybe something there, but I just want to say I think this is such a big improvement over what we saw the first time. I didn't know how you were going to make it work the first time when we first saw the plans, and this is really quite a nice improvement. And um, 
Uh, I, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add. I think my fellow board members have pretty well, uh, as well as staff, have pretty well covered things, and I, that was a good, thorough overview from the applicant. Um, I, I think we have unanimity on the two waiver requests, and uh, that includes me, provided, uh, as appears to be the case, that the uh, peer reviewer the engineers are on board. Um, and uh, as, as Nick and, and Roger have mentioned, uh, the devil will be in the details in terms of the, the snow, yep. snow management and, and sort of respecting that. that Buffer in the landscaping there, and it sounds like yep. everyone's dialed in on that. Um, and beyond that, um, just look forward to seeing things unfold, and hopefully see you again soon. I think it, uh, I agree that things have really moved in a good direction, and look forward to seeing more. Great, right. thank you. Thank you. Item number 11, Bell Family requests the Bell Family requests preliminary subdivision review for a four lot conservation subdivision yeah, titled Bell Family Subdivision, Assessor's Map R30, Lot 6. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you just noted, this is for a conservation, conservation subdivision within the RF district. As uh, board members will note, um, Certain characteristics of lots, including amount of wetlands, uh, uh, triggered the need for lots in the RF to go through our conservation subdivision design, um, which does require 50%, at least 50% of the land to remain as open space. Um, but it does also permit for smaller lots and reduced road frontage. Um, and so the applicant has attempted to design in those uh, considerations. Um, let's see, in reviewing this application, um, staff, you should have received staff comments as well as comments from Goral Palmer, the traffic review, and Angela Blanchett, the town engineer. Um, some of the staff comments have to do with the net residential calculation and be sure that uh, the requisite uh, subtractions are being uh, taken from the uh, from the matrix, and there's actually a revised um, uh, calculation done to ensure that included the, 10 the re requisite 10% for roadways. Even though no roadway is is proposed, you still need to subtract out 10% for roadways regardless, um, and that's pretty clearly stipulated, so that was done. Um, there's also, um, in considering net residential calculations, there's also questions about accessibility of land um, and, and determination of the planning board. And so there was some comment from staff in regards to that as well. Um, we'll note, and as I just mentioned, Angela Blanchett goes into much more detail um, that uh, staff is seeking a bit more information in regards to a stormwater approach. Um, basically, the applicant, as we just, as I just noted, there isn't any infrastructure per se being uh, proposed, at least public infrastructure in terms of roadways or what have you. Um, but generally, stormwater approach relies heavily on individual grading plans for each lot, and given the characteristics of the overall parcel, um, fairly undulating, um, staff feels that's worth at least some recognition of what a future development scenario may look like. Um, the zoning administrator identified that lot C is unusual and inconsistent with the zoning ordinance in terms of front yard. Um, typically, or the expectation is that there be a adequate building envelope at the front yard. It appears um, when staff look at this more closely that there could be potential to, um, given that road front is only required at 100 feet, that I think it's lot B uh, ha is in excess of 200 feet, so there might be some ability to um, to adjust lot lines to, to create a conforming lot geometry. Um, I guess one of the other issues that we need to address is that the um, each lot needs to demonstrate that they have two passing test pits, and um, lots A and B have only demonstrated that they have one at this time. Um, 
And I guess the only other item from staff comments I'd just highlight is typical, typical expectations for underground utilities, and the applicant is proposing over, uh, above ground. Um, and so um, but with that, I would turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. And Thank you. I'll, I'll I guess the one thing I will note, sorry, um, is that this, all the other items we've gone through tonight had been before the board on multiple occasions, and so after seven or eight items, we're finally to the item for its first review. All right. And is there another conservation subdivision? <laughs> another conservation. And I will turn it back to Lee. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, members of the board. Uh, Lee Allen with Northeast Civil. I'm joined tonight by Bruce Bell and his uh, sister Linda, um, where the Bruce owns a lot that has already been previously cut out years and years ago, um, and his family is the one that owns the land. Um, we're seeking preliminary subdivision approval, we hope. Um, to talk about some of the issues that Jay had brought up, the, the stormwater. Um, so Angela and I had a discussion about, well, how do you design stormwater for a building that you don't know the size of or the location of? And, I, and that's when we said, well, you know, in other towns we require grading plans that show, as part of the building permit, where you'd put stormwater infrastructure. Um, so we actually had a, a fairly lengthy discussion about how we think we would treat these. Um, our thoughts are, and this is very similar, um, you'll recall the, the Risbera subdivision off of Highland Ave. We did stone drip edge filters, so it's when the water runs off the roof, they're collected in um, a depth three feet of stone. It is filtered into under drains um, and then carried off and discharged off site. Um, that's how we're proposing to handle the roofs here as well. Um, also similar to that subdivision, um, the driveway runoff. We're, um, on that subdivision, we had rain gardens on some sites at the end of the road um, that were basically under -drain, small underdrain filters that were rain gardens, and that's the, the similar process to what we're proposing here. Um, very simple, very straightforward, and, and we think they, they would work well on, on each of these lots. Um, as far as overhead utilities versus underground utilities, Typically that underground utility requirement is when you're building a new road and you're putting utilities underground as you're building your new road and then obviously the house lots will be served with underground service. I question whether that's feasible here with an existing overhead utility network. I mean it seems a lot simpler to me to come off of the overhead line and run a service right to the right to each building. Um, if that's something that's a, a deal killer, we can certainly talk about it, but it just seems to make sense that when you're building new, you put underground in, you run underground services. This, the infrastructure, we're not building anything new. These are all taking advantage of existing road frontage. So in that case, I'd, I'm confused as why we'd go force an overhead utility underground just for the service when all the other services overhead, but we can certainly talk about that. Um, test pits, lot A, lot B, what happened is the um, Albert Frick and Associates had supplied us the data. They supplied us the most recent data. There was actually test pits that were done out here probably 10, 12 years ago that we don't have where there's actually additional test pits that were passed. They knew that. They just never forwarded us the information. Once we get the information, we'll add it to the plans, but uh, we've got it on a good source that there are passing test pits on each of these lots. They're just not shown on the plan. So the net residential density calculation, um, there's been some discussion over whether certain parts of the land should be used and counted towards that. Um, property, the upland in question is this, this spot along here, the northwest corner of the site. This area that I'm pointing out is all upland area. And has been said, it's, unex it's inaccessible. Um, really, you could, you could easily get there coming off the back of this lot. The grades are you know, only about four to six feet higher. It gently slopes down to this flat area. These are wetland fingers. Uh, but I'll point out, as part of this conservation subdivision, this applicant has not filled any wetlands. We have the right under state law to fill up to 4,300 square feet of wetlands. So this shaded yet orange area here is roughly 3,000 square feet of wetland fill. If we were to do that, this, this land all becomes contiguous upland. So I'd point back to the board saying, you know, that is accessible. Within our rights, we could fill that wetland that becomes 
contiguous upwind that we could get access to. Uh, similarly, the frontage issue down here that was brought up by, by staff, we could have had a 100 foot wide lot just the way we proposed it. We could have run it back here, we could have filled 400 square feet of wetland and we could have met this, but we're trying, as under the conservation wetland, it's the intent, I believe, of the ordinance to not fill wetland. So that was our proposal, not to fill any wetland. In fact, these lots are better than most conservation lots where they're not even in the wetland setback. So as part of, I think, the process and going through this and figuring out what's right on the net residential density calculation should it also be considered that we are in a conservation subdivision and we're proposing no wetland fill where under rights of Maine state law, we have the right to fill 4,300 square feet without even getting a permit, and we could have done that, but we didn't. Um, so with that, I turn it back to the board and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, before we do that, I will invite anyone who would like to come up and make public comment to do so at this time. All right, seeing none, we will turn to the board. And uh, Roger, would you like to start this time? Uh, actually, let me pass right now. Okay. okay. <laughs> me too. All right. Great. Right down the other All end. All right. So, <laughs> passing on this side. Susan. Okay. Did you say preliminary approval? You didn't say that. I said I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of town. Um, there's just too many things. First of all. All the good land is gone. It will go again. I know, but but I meant for I meant for development. The easy developable land is gone. Conservation easement is what we are seeing over and over and over again. And you know what? We're getting pretty good at it. We're getting we're really getting pretty good at it. It's kind of down to a routine that we go through. Um, <clears throat> with that in mind, the fact that no wetland is being suggested for filling is terrific. If there are problems in terms of not meeting the letter of the ordinance, and in order to do that, we have to make fill, we have to fill wetlands. I don't think there's any question as to which way to go. So I'm with you. I mean, I'm, whatever it takes to save wetlands, and if it if it creates an ordinance problem, then the board's going to have to be told exactly where that problem lies and see if we can do something about it. But I mean, really, it's, it's overwhelming to look at this and think you're going to be able to get four house lots out of this. Um, by the way, number four on the subdivision review staff comments, if I may, I didn't know about the requirement for front yard, where there be an adequate building envelope on the front yard setback. The zoning administrator brought that to planning staff's attention. And the... And, go ahead. Uh, no. Yeah. The one we just looked at, Sabaj or Sabaj, I don't know yeah. how to pronounce it, mm -hmm. lot 14 or whatever that is, way up there, mm -hmm. it's not at the front of the lot. The, the front of the lot is the right. wetland. The wetland area. So, you know, then yep. when you start thinking right. about applying that, it gets to be pretty, yep. and again, I think if, you've got a, if you've got a farmland, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to suggest, I think, you know, this is a, the area where the zoning administrator sort of looked at this lot and said, well, if someone came to me and said, this is what I want to create outside of subdivision, outside mm -hmm. of sort of conservation subdivision, these are the type of issues we'd flag. I think what was been discussed or addressed about, you know, trying to create this sort of funky lot, if you will, is due to trying to avoid wetlands. So is there right. a way to try to make it more conformant if possible? I think, you know, the, the sort of discussion about being able to run, move the lot line over and include the yeah. wetlands, that's, that's not quite accurate because then that area gets excluded from their open space. And so what I don't does, really but, care. But I, uh, either me. way. Yeah. I don't really care how it gets worked yeah. out. I just think that my, my point here is yeah. that there's got to be a way yep. that it can be done, okay? And and I don't want to I don't want to say that it can't happen, but it that that can be made to happen. It can be made to happen. Um, mm -hmm. 
the, the thing, what to do about the fingers of the uplands. I don't quite understand. I don't understand the concern. Do that for me. Yep, so the question is, what the, what, when you do your net residential calculation, there's seven, eight, nine items you mm -hmm. need to subtract. And so when staff devised the comments, the question had to do with those pieces of those fingers, as you will. Mm -hmm. do, does the board find that they, let's see, um, I'm just trying to be sure I find it here. Are, so the portion of the parcel, which because of existing land uses or lack of access, are isolated and unavailable for building purposes, which for building purposes seem like that would be pretty tight, or for use in common with the remainder of the track of parcel. So the question is, so how how does how do those wetland finger or those upland fingers, I'm sorry, fit with the remainder of the site? For example, I think you know the Thurber subdivision that you just brought up is a, a good example. Beyond, there's certainly it's a much different context, and so, but there's a host of wetland, uh, sorry, upland beyond a large stretch of wetland where where their development ends. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, we I'm, saw with that large, I'm with you. And so the board sort of said, yeah, that's isolated. That that's unaccessible. And so the question simply is being put to the board what it, it wasn't this is a question to the board as to how do you determine these upland fingers? Are these accessible? Are you willing to consider these as part of the net residential calculations? And we've done it before. Mm -hmm. Susan, I, I'm very curious. Are you all comfortable with that? Because that with what? With including that as, as part of the... Uh, I'm not sure. That's okay. why I'm asking all these That's questions. That's why I'm asking. I'm not sure. Um, I have a, my, my basic sense is this is not... The goal here is to save wetlands. Mm -hmm. Okay? This saves wetlands. Um, you can't get out there and walk around in it. Maybe you can and use it as open space and use it for recreation and a lot of our uh, of our conservation um, subdivisions have that kind of open space available. And Mr. Risberis that we just talked about is a perfect example because it's down there and it's up higher. That's open space that is actually usable for recreation, et cetera. I think this is a very different scenario. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of land that's wetland, and we can get four lots out of it. Unconventional, though they may be, a little odd to look at, for sure, but I'm not sure it can't be made to work. I'm certainly not in any position to talk about giving any kind of approval, but I think that it's worth looking at. I, to your point, I think one, one of maybe the applicant might... If, the board so interested to be able to highlight the existing use of that land. You know, is it is it sort of considered a offshoot of their existing parcel, or is it something that is like here? Well, that that's what the ordinance sort of talks about: is these lands being uh, isolated for either building purposes or for common use. And so I think it, it's really talking about the accessibility. How does it play into the overall lot? It, um, you know, is it is it something that is commonly considered part of that lot, or is it so isolated that you, you can't even get there? And, that and therefore, it should not be used as net res. That's that's what the ordinance talks about. Okay. That, that's where I'm the ordinance it. I'm getting it. gives I'm sorry, the planning board the, their direction, yes. Okay. Okay. A uh, quick question that has nothing to do with that, but I have to know. Uh, West Beach Ridge Road, lot D, shows it. Is there presently a building on Lot D? Yes, that's an it, it, that's. And it will be brought into this. Correct. In so really, we're talking about three new building lots three and building one lots, right. one lot for the existing home. Interesting. That anyway, never mind. Never mind. Um, no one's already in existence, right? The answer to your question for me about the net the res today. I'm going to wait. Okay. I have to have staff. There, just just for a point of clarity, the property that's shown as uh, NF Bruce Bell, it's yep. a nice square. Yep. That parcel was long ago broken out. The right. piece of land we're looking at includes lot A, 
the wetland open space, lot B, lot C, lot D, all the way up to Beach Ridge Road. Right. So um, there is an existing on this, boy, how big is this parcel? 10.38. Uh, on, on this total parcel, current parcel is 10 acres. There's one house up near the intersection of Beach Ridge and West Beach Ridge, and that's going to now become a one acre lot, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have three other new lots, A, B, C, and the open space lot, right. just for. The original lot for lot B. Mr. Mr. Bell, you could can, you? You can come on up and introduce yourself, and we'll be happy to hear from you. Bruce Bell, 13 West Beach Ridge Road. Um, Lot D is the homestead. That's where my mother and father and all of us grew up, okay? okay? That lot originally was only 4.3 acres. 0.43 acres. And now it's being enlarged with the conservation subdivision to uh, what it shows on the plan. So that's a change from what it was to what it will be, and it'll actually be a larger lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think Susan had a question. The question to the, an the answer to the question about <laughs> until I really understand this, right? <laughs> question to the answer um, about the uplands. I truly don't know. I don't have any problem with the concept of it in this particular situation, but I do understand that it's a very legitimate question. And <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to come down on that side right now. The rest of it, I think, will work out. I, I think I, might, I can throw out kind of our rule of thumb of what, when we consider access. Oh, throw it out. So if we could get a permit or we could do it legally and get access to it through some means of filling or whatever that yeah. be, and we could get a permit for that, in this case, we, we don't even need a permit. We could get access to that land. It would all be contiguous upland if we were to fill that small and that's, piece. Yeah. And that's that piece of brown that you yes. stated on there? It makes good sense to me. I mean, if, you look, if you go around fooling around with numbers long enough, you can make them work for you. <laughs> I was married to a mathematician once, and that's what I learned. So I have no problems with it. I have other questions, but I think those can wait. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. You got me chewing. Excuse me. Um, I don't have a problem with um, counting all of the wetlands as, as conservation. Um, or is contiguous. I say that because the part of the conservation is to preserve it. And um, access, if you're trying to preserve something, seems to me something that you usually try to limit. So, um, I don't have any intentions of playing in the wetlands. I don't think many others do either. So, let it count, um, is my opinion. The shape of Lot C is disturbing to visually look at. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there's something, hopefully something that can make that a little bit better. And I maybe that's the maybe that is what you come up with and there were more disturbing images and this is the <laughs> least of them. But right. it is really a funny lot. It, I mean right. I agree. And <laughs> I wanna point out Jay and I had a conversation earlier today that the the stance that the zoning administrator has taken on this is different. It's a change to what they had been taking. It had been if you had frontage at the front setback, if you had required for 100 feet and you had 100 feet at the front setback, then whatever happened to the rest of the lot happened to the rest of the lot. This is kind of a substantive change that has happened in the past month or so. This wow. Is wow. Huh. Well, so, well, I, I, and that's, so that's why it looks like it looks. And okay. Could, could there be changes? Yeah, could there be some small amount of wetland fill to make it look right? Yeah, is there probably a happy medium somewhere in between there? Yes. Can you look for it? <laughs> right. So I obviously offered you plenty of guidance there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think I agree with Susan. I, I don't think this is ready for approval this evening, um, but I think generally you get the idea. Um, as far as your exception to the utilities, I'm okay with the above ground utilities in this situation considering your abutters, all the neighbors, the entire road is all above ground. Um, and this usually flies in the face of how I personally feel about above ground utilities. So for me to say that, I hope you appreciate what I'm saying because um, 
If anyone's ever been to Montreal, um, they've done underground utilities the right way. You, you actually see trees. It's beautiful. Um, so anyways, that's my two cents for the evening. Thank you. I'm still all set. <laughs> Are you you're all set? Yeah. You wanna, did you have anything? Or? No, I'm all set. Okay. Ron? Yeah. Um, I guess I'm with my fellow board members down the other end, still not quite sure about the net residential acreage thing. But listening very closely, I agree with Susan that somehow in protecting the wetlands that this could be worked out in some manner. I don't have a, an answer for either at this particular time. Um, let me ask Jay a question. If the zoning officer says that lot C is not in, in compliance as far as he's concerned with the front yard. <coughs> Does that supersede anything that we may say? Well, I think when it comes to subdivisions and approving lots in a subdivision, the board has the ultimate say, um, okay. provided we're not doing anything that's so far out of compliance. So I think in this instance, where the board's going through a conservation subdivision design review, um, you know, I think there can be arguments made. Um, should the board be comfortable with Lot C, which it seems I'm generally hearing, um, you know, I, I think staff would still like to encourage the applicant to take a look at how they could work with the frontage between Lots B and C to mm -hmm. maybe become a little bit more compliant. But again, I don't think this is a to, uh, I believe Miss Oglis sort of talked about a showstopper, maybe I heard her come up with earlier, something like that. I don't know that this is a showstopper issue, but just one that requires its due diligence that the board's giving it. Okay, uh, thank you. And stormwater approach that mm -hmm. I'm in the dark. Yeah, so I think as, as Mr. Allen pointed out, there's typically we see a subdivision that has infrastructure that's being built i.e. a road, and, and we sort of deal with that. Here, um, and frankly, this is maybe the third one of these we've seen in the last little, maybe even the fourth, where, you know, the lots are are being created off the existing road. But um, due to the amount of development that's going to occur across the three lots, four lots, if, you, if you're including lot D, I think it is, um, they the overall impervious area is going to exceed our one acre threshold. So I think what, we have, what we've done in the past is, and what we're seeking at this time, is for the applicant to provide at least a, maybe it doesn't have to be to the nth degree engineered plan for each lot, but at least a plan that sets the direction that our engineers can be comfortable that yes, these lots can be built on and can accommodate stormwater um, both in terms of quality and quantity without having adverse impacts. And once we sort of set a general baseline, then presumably a condition of approval would be that any final grading plans be a condition of a building permit. So when the applicants mm -hmm. do come in for a building permit, that the final engineering be, that is when it gets to the nth degree scrutinized. So we just want to understand at this point at this point, we don't even know if it can generally be dealt with. Do we have a sense that something could be done? Sure, but that's not, the ordinance not isn't about that. sense, it's about knowing. So that's sort of where I, I believe Angela is, and plan, you know, my, my thoughts are on it, and I believe Angela is trying to convey with her memo as well, so. I like when you're on vacation, because you say things that I even understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, and I would just echo what Jay just said without repeating it. I think yeah. that was well stated and what the intent is and what the need is. Yeah. So, um. yeah, And that's something that other communities do. We've done it in uh, Falmouth, Portland. I'm trying to think. I like it. Other and it, it's effective. It, it does work. And I'll echo what Nick said. I'm okay with the above ground utility since that's what seems to be out there already. And, so I don't have any problem with that. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Um, as uh, as we've mentioned a couple times, we seem to be seeing 
a lot of these conservation subdivision proposals lately. Um, a lot of the kind of low-hanging fruit around town has been developed, and uh, certainly not a commentary on the quality of the of the land or anything. It's more, you know, the, within the context of the ordinance, how developable it is. And I would uh, echo what Ms. Oglis said about uh, the fact that overall, I think we've gotten collectively pretty good. And when I say we, I mean not only the board, but staff, as well as the, the, the uh, engineers who typically represent applicants on these projects, have gotten good at um, figuring these things out. And so I think a couple years ago, I would have been a lot more shocked or scandalized by <laughs> the configuration of lot of these, but I guess I've just been numbed a little bit, and not numbed, but I, I think I've seen enough of these now, and I think in general, we at the board have that we know, we have a fair amount of confidence that that they can work, even if on paper initially they look a little odd. Um, that said, I, I would encourage the applicant and, and the owner to, to consider, um, consider uh, looking at, at that demarcation between lots B and C to see if there's a way to to um, improve that a little bit. And then obviously we'll sort of see how that plays out. Um, just looking at some of the loose ends here, um, on the uh, in terms of the, the the fingers, if you will, we were talking about with the upland and the, and the wetlands. Uh, I think one of the lessons we've learned in looking at these proposals is that um, while we have to be really careful to to stay within the letter of the ordinance as much as possible and definitely honor the, the spirit and what the overall goals are. Um, I think we, we've learned that we have to look at some of these on a case-by-case -case basis, not in, not in the sense that we're not treating them all fairly, but that there are unique circumstances and we kind of have to step back and look at, you know, is this overall uh, making things better in terms of preserving open space and or wetlands. And I think in this case I would agree with Ms. Douglas and others that um, that on balance uh, this this uh, does meet the the intent of, of the of the ordinance in terms of preserving wetlands and certainly appreciate the fact that no wetland filling is being contemplated at this point. Um, Staff noted in, in staff note number five uh, that it would be good to have contours uh, on future iterations of the, the drawings uh, on the lots, and I, I agree that would be helpful. Um, <coughs> we'll look forward to. If I, if I could add something to that, the, sure. the registry does not like contours on their subdivision plans because it makes them hard to read, but we can certainly provide you a separate plan that shows it all together. Okay, I think so for review purposes, particularly yeah. on these types of sites. Yeah, that's why that's I actually had the presentation yeah. that I had everything laid on one. Okay. There's just a lot of stuff on one right. sheet that way. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, you mentioned the additional test pit data, and we, via our peer reviewers, will look forward to yeah. seeing that. And, um, and then finally, on the utilities, I guess I'm with with Nick and others that aesthetically, personally, I always would prefer we take every opportunity to go underground, but I. I appreciate the applicant's point that this is an existing road with existing infrastructure, and so um, probably not really necessary or, or appropriate to require that on this. Um, so with that said, again, I think you know it looks like there's some challenges. It looks a little bit daunting, but based on past experience, including recent experience, I'm fairly confident that we can get there. Yep. Uh, does anyone have anything else? Yeah, I just how old is that those test pit? It, how old was it, the one that there you said? some in 2013, and I think the ones previous were 2005. And, and what's the, does it have what's to be every so often? I'll ask those who know more about that. I'll tell you why I ask. I put My point, Ron, is dirt is always the same. I'll tell you why. <laughs> no, no. I'll tell you, no, that's not true, because I had to put a new septic system in my house, and <laughs> there were test pits way before then, and they did a new one. They said I had a new one, and they ha I had to reverse my whole septic system to the other side of the house because they say the sand did not meet the, the current day ordinance. Okay, awesome. fair enough. So that's the point we'll take, and we'll yep. we'll uh, we'll look to our experts to help us. Same test. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Do you need anything else from us? Not at this time. Unless you <laughs> want to grant preliminary approval. Preliminary approval. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. You asked. Okay. He's very good at waiting. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. We have a town planner's report. Uh, I do just want to mention that uh, uh, plan board members will recall that the Long Range Planning Committee conducted the Higgins Beach, um, uh, take a look at the Higgins Beach neighborhood earlier in the summer. <coughs> they are prepared, preparing to report out, and um, there'll be a follow up meeting in the coming weeks. I apologize that my Laptop did not connect to the server tonight, so I don't have don't have the date in front of me. But certainly, we will notify okay. board members when that occur. But folks who are in oh September first, September first. Ah, Karen nailed it. Thank you, Karen. Karen. Um, and more information is available on the website, or will be soon. Under Higgins Beach. Under Higgins yeah, Beach. That's a, that's a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. That's a week from tomorrow. Right. Yes. This okay. this week we should be putting up the draft. Um, ordinance onto the website when Joanne gives that to me. So Super. Right. Super. That's what I have for you. Thank you, Karen. Right. Mm -hmm. How about the administrative amendment report? Two items to report. Um, one is a minor amendment to the Morrison Development Center. The board approved an addition to that building not too, well, maybe four or five months ago, whatever the case may be. Um, they actually, in doing their final work, they reduce the size of the addition slightly. It's ostensibly in the same area. It doesn't really change much um, in the way of layout, so that was approved. And Mercedes-Benz uh, got an uh, administrative approval for their addition for, I believe it was a change to the overhead door. Um, I actually wasn't involved in that review process. It occurred while I was on vacation, so maybe Mr. Fellows you just give us a little quick once over. Sure, just very quickly, uh, it, it was just a change in dimension to one of two overhead doors on the addition. So the addition, there was nothing different about the addition itself. The addition was already sort of there. Um, but it was just that uh, one overhead door was made a little bit higher. And I found that to be a, a minimus change. So. Mm -hmm. Is there a third sign showing up yet? There. Their third <laughs> sign has that appeared? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, not yet. No. Not if it's a landscape. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's true. Any correspondence beyond the email that we referenced earlier on Dunstan Village? All right. Any planning board comments? Yeah. Oh, you go first. Oh, you go first. Oh, my God. We were ready. Um, <laughs> no, I just want to make sure. Did I have this right? I thought I saw an email come through about the Gorham, Scarborough. Tomorrow. tomorrow night. Is that tomorrow night? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Thank you, Roger. What time tomorrow night? Is that 7 p.m.? Mm -hmm. Here? Fire Department? No, it's uh, North uh, Grange. Uh, North, uh, North, Grange. North Grange. Yes. Yeah. North Grange. Yep. It's here at 8 o'clock tomorrow night, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> what are you saying, Roger? <laughs> Higgins Beach. Better served over here, huh? Yeah, at yeah. the Higgins Beach Clubhouse. Okay. Right. Good Tomorrow point. is the... North Grange, 7 p.m., that's the firehouse. It's right behind the little mart. Correct. Yeah, okay. Thank you. That's, I just want to make note yeah. of that. Yeah. No, nope. thank you. And I would like to take just... I'm just proud of us. And I want to go on record as saying I'm proud of us. I mean, we're getting pretty good at this, and we're taking it by in stride. And I know we're not 100% right all the time, but... We're starting to we're starting to get the hang of this, so I just had to say yay for us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Susan. Duly Thank noted. You. I'll second that. <laughs> Thank you. Corey, well, uh, to Jay on this um, Higgins Beach report. Yes. Is that how's that going to be disseminated to all the people down at Higgins Beach? Um, let's see. I know Mr. Bacon had a large a, uh, email listserv from folks who attended, mm -hmm. so he's blasted out to those folks, and it will be put on the website for those who are interested and want to take a look. Okay. Um, so. yep. And just quickly, is, is the uh, consultant still involved, or is it at this point are we sort of the on our own? The consultant is still involved, okay. helping with the final drafting of the ordinance. I asked partly because they seem to do a pretty good job of, of sort of helping with outreach and, and 
managing the, the process to this point. And uh, in case folks didn't hear, Karen pointed it out that that meeting a week from tomorrow is at down at Higgins Beach at the clubhouse. Oh, okay. So, excuse to go down. To Higgins. Okay. Anyone else? Move to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Thank you. Discussion. Uh, <laughs> no worries.